unprecedented challenge put forward by COVID-19 pandemic, professional education has evolved and a more efficient virtual platform has been well developed. Having said that, I eagerly hope that with the fight back by vaccination program, we can both connect physically and virtually in the next Hong Kong CCI meeting. With that, I wish you to have an enjoyable and fruitful learning experience in our exciting program today. Andy, to you. Are you muted? Thanks, NY. So uh, today we are really honored to have a very experienced moderator and panelist uh, to join our conference. So it's my pleasure to introduce uh, my co-moderators, Father Rosanna Miran. Um, she's a professor in cardiovascular clinical research and outcomes, professor of medicine, cardiology, and population health science and policy, Icon School of Medicine and Mount, uh, Mount Sinai. And Professor Du, uh, du Wu Park from Korea, and he's a professor of interventional cardiology, Asan Medical Center, University of Asan, uh, 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 Asan College of Medicine. Professor Michael Roth from Switzerland, and he's a professor of cardiology, vice chairman of cardiology, and director of interventional cardiology unit, University Hospital of Geneva. So our experienced panelists include Dr. William C.K. Chen from Hong Kong. Um, he's the current president of Hong Kong, of Hong Kong Society of Transcapital and the Vascular Therapeutics. And um, uh, our president, uh, Dr. Ai Chen, um, and Dr. Gary Singh Chen is the president of the Hong Kong Society of Congenital and Structural Heart Disease. And Dr. Uh, Yip Man Fai, he's the consultant of the Central Hospital Condi de Cell uh, Genero and Macau. And Dr. Christopher Jensen from Germany, and he's associate professor of medicine, medical director of a born uh, of a, uh, uh, born company. Dr. David Kettle from South Africa. He's a cardiologist in St. Dominic's Hospital. And uh, he's the immediate past president of the South African Society for Cardiovascular Intervention. Dr. Simon Nam uh, um, from Hong Kong. He's an associate consultant of the Queen Mary Hospital. Uh, Simon is also the course uh, director of this uh, uh, important conference. Dr. Lam Ho is a consultant of director and, cons and director of Cat Cat Lab Human Hospital. Uh, Lam Ho is also the course director of this course. Dr. Sydney Lowe from Australia. He's the director of Cardiac Cat Lab Liverpool Hospital, Sydney. And uh, Professor uh, Jiaming Lui from Taiwan. He's a professor of medicine, National Yaming University, chief of healthcare center, Taipei uh, Veterans General Hospital, Taipei. And Dr. Paul Ong from Singapore, he's a senior consultant cardiologist, Heart Specialist International. And um, Dr. Lucio uh, Patila uh, from Argentina, he's the program director of CTO and complex CTR, uh, PCI of ICBA. Professor uh, Santosa from Indonesia, is the cardiologist at Met Metistra Hospital. Uh, he also received a lot of awards, including um, uh, the award for his contribution to the field of the interventional cardiology, Indian Life India. And um, Dr. Uh, Rahul Sharma from USA is the Director of Structural Interventions, Stanford Healthcare, Clinical Assistant Professor of Medicine and Stanford University. And uh, Dr. Tam Lee from Hong Kong, he's the Chairman of the Hong Kong Public Hospital Cardiology Association. And Professor Jack Tang from Singapore, he's the director, deputy head of cardiology and director of coronary care unit, National Heart Center Singapore. And um, he's also the uh, president of the Asia Pacific Society of Cardiology. And thanks uh, Professor Tang uh, for making this event also uh, week, uh, on live on the APSC Facebook Live tonight as well. And uh, Professor Brian Yan from Hong Kong, he's the head of division of cardiology, the, Trans the Chinese University of Hong Kong. And Dr. Chi Chao from China, he's the Associate Chief Physician, Chinese Academy of Medical Science, National Center for Cardiovascular Disease, Fuwei Hospital. Oh, okay, so, um, so I would, may I take this opportunity to invite Dr. Rosanna Miran to introduce our first speaker. So Rosanna, please. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. And what an incredible honor for me to be part of this. I wanna thank the Hong Kong College of Cardiology for inviting me to this Hong Kong Complex Cardiovascular Intervention 
2021, my most thrilling case in the past three years. I can't wait to see these cases. And uh, this is the second virtual meeting and I am uh, really, really pleased and honored to be moderating today and also to be introducing our first uh, speaker, Dr. Shozo Ishihara from Japan, uh, Osaka, Japan. He's the vice director of the hospital manager of cardiology department and, and uh, vice director of the hospital manager of the cardiology department at Mimihara General Hospital in Osaka. And we're thrilled to hear about your most thrilling case in the past three years. Dr. Shozo Ishihara. Thank you for Jefferson. Uh, um, I'm so great. Uh, it's a great honor to join this uh, great conference. And also, I'm so happy to be your first speaker. Uh, can you see my uh, slide? It's okay. Yes. So um, this is uh, uh, my most thrilling case in these three years, and also. This is very serious uh, complication case, but uh, I I think uh, this is very very educational for all uh, for the uh, for all PCI doctors. So uh, the title is severe epicardial channel perforation bailed out with various embolization during retrograde CT or PCI. So the patient was sixty six years old male and he had stable angina. And she, she, she find she, uh, was uh, showed proximal LED CT lesion, and so with collaterals from RCA, acute marginal branch, and also from circumflex. Uh, his coronary risk factors were diabetes, dyslipidemia, and also smoking. So ECG showed uh, poor our progression in uh, chest lead, and also his renal function was uh, relatively preserved. And echocardiography showed a uh, low ejection fraction, but uh, his LED territory, territory was uh, still viable. And um, this is a first CS image. Uh, we can see the uh, total occlusion at proximal LED, like this, here. Yeah. And also we can see the good collateral uh, from uh, this type of complex, uh, this uh, epicardial channel, like this. And also this is a uh, RC image. Uh, we can also see the good uh, collateral flow from acute marginal uh, branch like this, uh, direct connection um, via uh, apex to distal LED like this. So uh, this is the uh, system and strategy for this LED situation. So uh, we choose uh, a bilateral approach and antigrade guiding was eight French uh, from femoral artery and also uh, retrograde guiding catheter is seven French from radial artery, uh, EBU, and also uh, amplex left one. And strategy was, uh, uh, this case was not in our hospital, so other hospitals case. So uh, we uh, judged uh, this case should be performed by local doctor. So, uh, so it means CTO proctors it. So uh, he tried to his best and if it is difficult, so uh, operator should be changed for me. And so he chose primary lateral grade approach, first, uh, first approach from RCA uh, epicardial channel. And uh, if it, it was difficult, uh, he moved to circumflex channel. And so next uh, option is septal stopping. So this is a tip injection from, uh, uh, right, uh, from right uh, collateral channel. And uh, it means so, uh, acute marginal branch. So uh, there is a strong bending point, but uh, the other part are almost straight and uh, it looks not so difficult like this. So uh, this was a caravel micro catheter. And uh, he started a uh, retrograde approach. So uh, we saw 03 guide wire 
So uh, he started to channel negotiation like this. And so uh, the uh, wire moves uh, very nice course like this. So after advancing guide wire, but uh, microcatheter is a little bit difficult to, to pass the so strong bending point on here. And uh, after pushing microcatheter, severe perforation uh, was uh, revealed like this. So it was so terrible situation. So this, this was the uh, epicardial channel and uh, relatively very good uh, coronary flow so that uh, it will uh, very serious situation. So that uh, I advised him to perform on prolonged balloon occlusion. Uh, and uh, this, this was a 2.0 millimeter balloon. Uh, but uh, in this point, he gave up uh, to continue by himself uh, to end also change operator from the local doctor to me. And in this point, uh, check the so, uh, left coronary. So that, uh, of course, we can see the collateral from sub uh, flow from circumflex. And also uh, from RCA, uh, so bleeding was uh, stopped, but now from circumflex, uh, still, uh, we can see still bleeding like this because uh, this is a so bilateral flow. So uh, in this point, I started retrograde approach from circumflex channel like this. And uh, we can see good flow uh, and also uh, started with um, carabel microcatheter and also so 03 uh, guide wire. And the channel negotiation was uh, uh, relatively uh, easy, but uh, yeah, in some uh, bending part, uh, wire uh, some, somehow stuck. But uh, fortunately, uh, the so 03 guide wire and also Caravel microcatheter uh, passed uh, this epicardial channel uh, like this. And fortunately, wire uh, was advanced into distal LED like this. And uh, check uh, with a CTO situation from retrograde tip injection and also anti-grade uh, guiding injection like this. So relatively, we can see the CTO lesion is still long. So that uh, I started uh, retrograde on wiring first. And uh, with Miracle 3 wire and also XTA wire couldn't uh, advance into CTO region. So that uh, changed to Gladius wire. Uh, this is also from Asahi. And so uh, very sleepy coating and also a uh, tip load is three gram. Uh, this wire fortunately advanced into CTO, but uh, direct cross is relatively uh, dangerous because this is uh, just proximal LED region. So that I started uh, anti grade approach with Corsair and also Gaia too. And uh, anti grade wire also advanced uh, with the information uh, of letter grade wire. This is a good uh, so uh, load map. So that uh, two guide wire is very near situation. And uh, after checking IVAS, uh, I performed reverse cut with two O balloon. Uh, from anti uh, open up with two O balloon. So fortunately, retrograde wire passed uh, the CTO part, but and also uh, the wire could advance into anti grade guiding catheter. But <laughs> unfortunately, uh, Caravelu. Microcatheter couldn't reach anti-grade guiding catheter because uh, this guiding catheter is long one. So uh, microcatheter length is not enough. So that uh, uh, I ad uh, advanced uh, additional guiding catheter because uh, anti-grade gu guiding and retrograde uh, from circumflex uh, to microcatheter and two wires are in guiding catheter. So that I add, uh, add one more guiding catheter, seven French guiding catheter from opposite side of radial artery. So uh, fortunately, uh, I could add insert guide extension catheter. Uh, if, if I use only one guiding catheter, it was difficult to advance guide, guide extension. But so <laughs> we can see three guiding catheter like this. So fortunately, uh, 
later grade uh, microcatheter could lead to guide extension catheter. And after that, externalization was uh, achieved. And uh, in this point, uh, I checked uh, retrograde injection, but uh, as a, I'm sorry, uh, retrograde injection from RCA, uh, but unfortunately still bleeding like this. Uh, in this point, uh, blood pressure dropped down and uh, we should perform emergent pericardial synthesis like this. So after um, synthesis, uh, uh, blood pressure was uh, preserved and so patient was stable so that we perform a uh, continue uh, CTO procedure. And so still uh, occlude with two balloon and uh, after externalization, anti-grade balloon open up to O balloon and also uh, sized up to three O balloon. Uh, put the stent uh, immediately uh, for mid LED and also uh, tip injection uh, from anti grade microcatheter. Uh, this was fine cross. So uh, we can see this This is a tip of fine, uh, fine cross. So we can see still breathing uh, from RCA side. Uh, uh, so uh, bleeding was blocked with balloon catheter, but so retrograde uh, uh, coronary flow will easily make uh, severe bleeding. So that I put uh, the uh, coil uh, like this. So uh, from uh, LAD side, so anti I put the two coils so deliver uh, uh, through fine cross like this. And this is the second coil. Uh, we can see the coil was uh, delivered from fine cross like this. And two coils were delivered like this. And uh, put the stent uh, from left main to LED. And after putting the stent, two stents uh, from guiding catheter injection, still we can see still bleeding, uh, even after put two coils. So that uh, in this point, maybe RCA flow should be uh, uh, blocked so that uh, we put two coils from RCA side like this. So totally four coils from RCA and also from integrate from LAD side. So four uh, coils are uh, deployed, but even uh, two cores, after two cores uh, from RCSI, side, still bleeding like this. So that uh, we discussed uh, which is better to put more cores and cores or uh, to put another so uh, material. So in this point, we can get the thrombus uh, from uh, puncture needle. Uh, like this, uh, there's a puncture needle. Uh, we can, uh, as you know, we can get the thrombus from a puncture needle, uh, so that we inject from a microcatheter uh, after thrombus embolization. Fortunately, hemostasis was achieved. Maybe thrombus is uh, maybe somehow mixed with core, and so it uh, made a good hemostasis. And also uh, from LED side, uh, we should uh, put something, but already thrombus was used. So we have no thrombus. So that uh, after uh, thrombus embolization, but from LED side still breathing, we can see like this. So that uh, from LED side, I decided fat tissue embolization. Uh, maybe you know uh, fat tissue is easily get from femoral puncture site. Maybe uh, around here, so from puncture site, we can cut by the small mess, small cutter. Uh, 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 it is inside, uh, uh, it is in, uh, uh, we can get uh, with the C dilator. So uh, after taking uh, fat tissue and uh, after injecting fat tissue, uh, hemostasis of the 
like this. Um, we can see uh, this may be a thrombus and uh, it is maybe uh, uh, um, around the uh, coils. So uh, it makes good hemostasis. So complete hemostasis from right side and also from left side was achieved. So uh, this is a final angel. Uh, we can get a good uh, uh, revascularization for LADCTO, and also uh, we can get a complete hemostasis. So this is a case summary, 60 years, six years old male, and the procedure time is around six hours, two long procedure. And fluoroscopy uh, relatively high, and but con contrast was not so high, 150 milliliter, because we performed retrograde approach. So chip injection was effectively uh, used. And uh, embolization materials are four coils and thrombus and fat tissue. Uh, this is my first case. <laughs> Uh, of using all kind of embolization and materials. So pericardial drain was retrieved next day. And so discharge after one week. So his condition was very nice. So uh, talking about the hemostasis of channel perforation, uh, the important point is detecting the bleeding site is very important. So maybe using microcatheter tip injection is very effective. And also, uh, uh, if uh, the perforation of bleeding is small, we, uh, we can choose the microcatheter wedging, or sometimes we can use negative pressure with microcatheter. And also, as you know, prolonged balloon inflation is uh, effective. And also, uh, so hemost hemostatic uh, stability is very important. So we should prepa um, prepare for pericardial synthesis. And uh, we should know uh, any kind of embolization materials, coil, thrombus, and fat tissue uh, are very important. And if uh, it happens in retrograde, uh, especially epicardial channel, bilateral approach, so it means bilateral embolization should be considered. So as you know, so uh, this kind of coil is uh, uh, very, very important. But uh, if doctor don't have so much experience, we should so prepare or we should make training for using cords. This is the last line. Uh, detector bleeding site immediately occlude by balloon or microcatheter, uh, hemodynamic stabilization, and prepare for pericardial synthesis and get used to various embolization. These are very important for uh, effective uh, so hemostasis for channel perforation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Thank you. Dr. Uh, Ishihara. We have seven minutes um, for um, a discussion and I'd like to open this up. This obviously was truly a nightmare case, six hours. Uh, and I think what happened here, you had um, what was I think life-saving here for this patient was your ability to have those two, um, to come at it at both sides, both from the antegrade from the LAD, as well as from retrograde with the use of coils. I must say, I've never used fat embolization, nor have I used um, a thrombus injection into a bleeding site. I wondered uh, if we can open this up to questions, but also my first question to you is, what do you do in a case like this where you need, um, you have all these catheters in, you're worried about thrombus formation across everything and the patient is bleeding. So are you keeping that patient still fully anticoagulated with heparin? Do you always use heparin? Do you stop the heparin? In, uh, and, and how concerned are you with placing these coils in the distal bed of uh, the um, uh, the site where you're actually um, performing a CTO. Did this patient fare well after all of this? So tough questions, but I think uh, yes. this might be good to start the discussion. Yes, thank you for nice and also very, very important question. So uh, anti-coagulation uh, is very important and very uh, serious co concern 
uh, during the PCI, so with uh, bleeding complication. Uh, for, uh, for this case, uh, if we can get enough embolization, maybe uh, so anticoagulation is enough strong, but maybe hemostasis might be uh, so up, uh, obtained achieved so that uh, we continue giving heparin. Of course, so we should check the so ACT or uh, so or maybe ACT should be around 300 because we use retrograde approach. Many guide wires, many micro catheters, and also two or three guiding catheters. So anti is very so important, and we should continue giving heparin. But uh, the most important is so to to reduce the so how can I say and the uh, blood pressure for uh, the perforation site. So if the so uh, giving pressure for uh, perforation site is reduced, so we can get hemostasis. It's important. So. Uh, if uh, the perforation site is difficult to uh, to make thrombosis, thrombosis like thrombosis, uh, uh, the embolization, for example, mid LAD, if perforation occurred at that time, it is difficult to embolize uh, mid LAD. But this part is easily, uh, so this part is okay to make embolization, so that I could continue uh, anticoagulation. And if we reduce anticoagulation at that time, we should. Or consider uh, uh, so uh, clot clot uh, clot, so that uh, we should flush a guiding catheter with saline, or uh, we should uh, uh, retrieve any other so uh, not needed devices or su such kind of yeah. Uh, Fantastic. Science. I mean, you have uh, so you're telling us that you would keep the anticoagulation at a low level. You're working towards embolization. I'd love to hear what. Professor Marco Rafi, we have so many wonderful, tal yeah. uh, talented uh, panelists here. Uh, Professor Rafi, and maybe we can also ask Professor Santosi, anyone who wants to, uh, Santoso, if you guys want to make uh, some comments on this case. Uh, we just have a couple of minutes. Uh, uh, thanks, Roxana. And um, it was a great case. And uh, I, I was an admirative of you continuing the, the CTO. My question is, you were uh, there were bleeding let's see, um, uh, fed from both sides. So from, from the uh, collateral from the right and collateral from the marginal. So obviously you had to coil uh, uh, both sides. The decision to continue CTO while ongoing bleeding actually, was this because you were concerned that uh, the LAD territory would have been in danger uh, and the, for example, septal collaterals may have not been sufficient, or why why will you continue on, on your procedure before taking care of the bleeding? Ah, uh, it's also very important point. So uh, maybe this LED was uh, mainly so uh, uh, so fulfilled from right right collateral and from circumflex collateral, so that after uh, so. Uh, balloon uh, blockade uh, from right side. And also if I perform uh, the retrograde from circumflex, at that time maybe LED territory uh, have no collateral flow. So it makes uh, patient condition uh, more so worse. So that uh, it was, uh, of course, so maybe, uh, so cardiac tamponade was happened before, but after a let, uh, retrograde procedure, maybe uh, patient blood pressure decreased at that time. So we consider uh, quit the procedure or continue procedure, but uh, get hemostasis of serious population is more important than avoiding the ischemia. So that I continue, but so maybe uh, it was many choices. So I should choose which is better. So. Uh, so maybe if you have some uh, suggestion, uh, it is happy to hear. We, you know, that's great. We have a, a, a question in the audience and please send in your questions. This is why we're here. Uh, and then we'll get to Paul Ong um, who wants to ask a question. Should you have just tried the septal uh, septals? This is one of the questions, uh, you know, did you, uh, you know, when you see something like this happening, should you have tried, would it have been, have been safer 
to go with the septal channels first when you saw that kind of a coiling bend in the apex where you were really going very far and then your catheter didn't reach in the end anyway. What was your, uh, what, what are your thoughts there? So uh, thank you for the question. So maybe septal uh, collateral is also one choice, but uh, so uh, pre-angiography pre showed very poor septal co connection. Mm -hmm. So because maybe, so from RC and from circumflex flow is so much, uh, so large, so that uh, I, I wonder I could pass the septal channel or not. Uh, I couldn't this so at that time decided. So and so uh, in my feeling, circumflex might be very easy, and so CTO uh, so connection is not so difficult for me. So that I choose uh, from circumflex. No, that's great. That's fantastic. We we just have. I'm just gonna let Dr. Ong go, and then there was chat in there about thrombin, how it could be dangerous, and I probably agree with that. Um, Dr. Ong, your last question, very short and short answer, please, because. We have a lot to do today. Yes, I only have so, a very uh, yes. short Thank comment so to make. So, yeah, apart have, from you say yes. this is a fantastic case and learned a lot, but I sometimes find that um, uh, I learned this from the Hong Kong Stand Group that doing very complex case with risk of perforation. Um, one one tips that I've learned is maybe before you heparinize the patient, just draw up ten mils of blood and have it on the on the trolley and leave it there. And if, if something like this happens, you you know you always have thrombus to use uh, to occlude any any perforation. And if nothing else happens, you waste the 10 mils of blood, no harm done. That's all I have to say. Uh, so muted, uh, so, may I mute it? Oh, sorry, okay. that's fantastic. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Uh, Ishihara. That was really a fantastic, um, fantastic, uh, 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 case. And now we go to my dear, dear colleague, Professor Duk Hubwa Park, from, uh, who's Professor of Interventional Cardiology at the Asan Medical Center, uh, University of Ulsan College of Medicine. He's currently the new deputy editor of Jack Asia, and I'm so, so pleased to see him. He has, he's tremendous, and of course, one of our moderators. He's uh, so well known to all of us. Uh, Professor Park, we can't wait to see your most difficult case in the last three years. Professor Park. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Meran. So, so I'm, I'm going to share my the most thrilling case in the past three years. This is a, a sort of complex application, the PCI region. I, I'm guessing the, the one of the audience experienced a similar case. I'm going to move to the, my case. This is my disclosure. So uh, look briefly, the brief background, the 51 year old male with stable angina and uh, uh, the, he was current heavy smoker, 25 pack year history. He has no uh, diabetic and hypertension and just current smoking. So looking at the ECG was absolutely normal. Chest X-ray was normal. The, the heart, there is no cardiomegaly and no pulmonary fusion. Looking at the transthoracic echocardiography and the ejection fraction is a 64 and the normal LV size, and the systolic function was normal and that there is no uh, regional wall motion abnormality. So, and the, looking at the coronary angiogram and the right coronary was looks normal and uh, the circumflex is big and the distal suck is just a small branch. It's just the medication alone is good. So uh, main target region is the bifurcation region over here. And the, uh, the diagonal branch is very big and uh, uh, looks like a near total occluded region. Also, and the mid LAD part is 60-70% uh, narrow the region. And we checked the FFR over here. The FFR value was 0 0.78, the mid LAD. So, and we decided uh, to uh, treat the middle LAD as well as the diagonal branch. So, and uh, initially we concerned about the diagonal branch uh, wire passage would be difficult, but uh, wire passage is very easy. It take uh, less than one minute. And uh, uh, we use the uh, uh, Sion blue wire LAD and diagonal branch. And uh, this is our routine. And we measure the 
uh, I boost in that this is LAD part, this is diagonal part, and the one of interesting part, diagonal osteum, we can see there is some uh, calcium in the osteum of diagonal branch as well as uh, LAD part, we can see some calcium, there is a circular calcium in the middle LAD and the diagonal osteum. So, and the, we decided to uh, the two stand technique for this region, diagonal branch is big, LAD branch is also big, and we decide to balloon crush technique. And uh, everybody is uh, frequently do DK crush technique in our nation is a non-compliant balloon, not fully reimbursed by government. We freak, uh, the, our the routine is the non-compliant balloon crush. And so we do pre-dilation 2.0 NC balloon in diagonal branch. And looking at the diagonal branch is a very expanded mid part and the size is not so small. So we should keep the big diagonal branch as well as big branch. So, and the, we do a uh, diagonal uh, branch stenting. We uh, put the drug eluding stent design 2.75 and 32. And uh, uh, after diagonal branch and the looks okay. And the distal part, there is some slow uh, some narrowing portion and the just the stenting is that gonna flow is looks okay. Okay, and then we put the uh, the high pressure dilation uh, using LED part and we put LED long stent design 3.5 and 38 and that this is NC balloon and that this is NC balloon and uh, we did a uh, uh, high pressure NC balloon dilation. Okay, and then we try to crush and uh, uh, the diagonal osteum part. This is a uh, crush part zooming and the prox LED. Uh, we put the 3.0, the high pressure NC balloon implanted up to uh, 18. So problem over here, after uh, NC balloon dilation in the uh, mid LED stenting, patient complain acute chest pain after LED stenting and high pressure balloon. And uh, uh, as you, you see, there was a complete obliteration of the diagonal flow. And although patient viral status is okay, but patient complained the severe chest pain over here. So, and then uh, briefly look back the, the design stand. This is a, one of a, uh, frequently used, uh, there was the 81 uh, microgram and the no more loading stand. This is uh, uh, just a, a open cell design and the, uh, uh, sickness is just H1 is a usual, is a, uh, not a sicker stenting. So, and the problem over here, and the, we try to rewiring at diagonal bench patient complained the uh, acute chest pain and the repeated uh, failure of rewiring is that there is a very the difficult uh, step. And the, the overall time we spend at least one hour, there was a over the process of the diagonal branch, and we initially used shown blue wire, and the second was a choice PT wire that was failed. Third, and the field XT wire also failed. And the, the next time we used the Crusade, and the, that was also failed, and the, we moved to the CT wire Kaya 2, it was also failed, and the, everything is a fail. And the, there was a take of one hour already, and the, uh, that, Definitely, this is not the situation. So, and the desperate rewiring at diagonal branch, and the finally we select a, a very most strong wire in our catheter. This is Concast Pro 12, and this is a, uh, the usually used for the CTO intervention. The even in the CTO intervention, Concast Pro 12 is a final step used wire. So, fortunately, diagonal OS wiring is passed, and the, this is uh, the movement of the di diagonal wire past that there was concast pro 12. So, and the anchoring of the LAD in, uh, using the NC balloon, we uh, try to put the 1.0 uh, compliant balloon and the successfully passed of the osteum of the diagonal branch. And then the, the because the Conquest Pro wire is too much stiff. So we try to exchange the more soft wire and the, put, uh, the insert of the Caribbean microcast 
to the diagonal osteum, and then the soft wire change from Conquest Pro 12 and the BMW wire. And then we do uh, added anchoring and uh, uh, put the NC uh, balloon. This is a 2.0 and uh, 2.75 NC balloon. We do very aggressive uh, NC balloon dilation and the diagonal osteum uh, as well as the middle diagonal part. So, and the, we check the, the IBUS evaluation in the LAD and the, as well as, uh, as, well as uh, the diagonal uh, the mid part and the looking at the, one of the interesting part, the diagonal veins in the posterior part, we can see uh, there is some thrombus-like uh, uh, region over there. It uh, looks like layered uh, uh, thrombus. So we do, this is a final step teaching balloon, the sequential in the LAD and diagonal bench and diagonal os. We do very aggressive uh, NC balloon dilation, LAD very aggressive sequential NC balloon dilation. And the, finally we do teaching balloon, NC balloon dilation, and the, we do everything for a final optimization. And then still and the distal part, uh, there is some very tight of region and the do, uh, put the additional the diagonal stenting uh, and the distal part is a much improved much much improved and uh, after remove and the uh, proximal diagonal steel we can see some irregular uh, narrowing over here and the uh, flow is good but still the diagonal osteum there was some irregular margin so uh, the this is the final ibus and the LAD part is okay diagonal osteum over here uh, there is some you know, the layer, the, the thrombus like region over there, the, although the stand opening is good, there is some the layered part of the, looks like some thrombus, intra-procedure thrombus, but at this time patient uh, either status is okay and the patient, uh, uh, there is no complaint of the chest pain. So, and uh, this is my slide and we can discuss a lot of things and the uh, discussion part. And the side of branch total gelling. And uh, so uh, first the discussion part that if you select a different stand like a, a ledger loot or giants and different story, there was a, our first guess. And the second story is the side of the branch total gelling. And if you use the different technique like DK crush or tap rather than balloon crush and different story, there is a, my second question. The third is uh, at this uh, uh, wiring chaos situation, how do we do? And that there was uh, sometimes happen, and that, that is a very uh, difficult situation. And uh, even after repeated NC balloon and final teaching balloon dilation and the layered intra procedure stent thrombosis is remained, how do you do? That was uh, my question to the audience and the panel. Thank you for your attention. Wow. Difficult case. A jailed a large a diagonal with a few hours of wiring, but congratulations in your final success story. And I'm sure this patient will do fine. Let's uh, let's open this up to, to all of our distinguished panelists. Let's start with Christoph Jensen. Uh, what, are, what, are, what are some of your tips? He put, uh, um, Dr. Park put, a, put up a lot of choices where he would have looked back and maybe done things differently. And that's the best thing about a failure or if you think it's a failure, this was a success, obviously, but what do you learn and how do you succeed? Uh, Dr. Jensen? Thank you, Roxana, for, um, for um, letting me, uh, for inviting me. Um, so um, it was an excellent case, uh, Professor Park. Thank you. We all know these frustrating feeling when we try to wire the side branch and it looks easy and, and, and the first wire doesn't work, the second one, the third one. And I'm, I'm really amazed that you went up to the Conquest Pro with a very strong tip to, to get there. Um, so my, my first thought was, I mean, I, I, I don't understand the reason why you shouldn't go in there in the side branch. And, and at least when I have an IBUS on the table, maybe uh, this would be the point where I try to do imaging and see what is going on, uh, especially you do an anchoring and then you were only then you were able to go to the microcatheter and the, the balloon in the, in the side branch. So that, that there must be some really strong mechanical uh, uh, obstacle in the way. Um, so the thrombus doesn't really uh, speaks for a hundred percent of this 
a near failure. So um, I would go for the for the IVOs first. W what is what is your impression there? Um, did you did you consider it, or were you just in the in a rush to to get a stronger and stronger wire to get there? So and uh, still I don't uh, fully understand the exact mechanism underlying how the, the, this case is difficult. Is my guess, and uh, you know, although we do not exactly the underlying mechanism, I guess and. Uh, uh, proximal tip was uh, too much overwrap. Uh, that would be some uh, one of the the plausible uh, the mechanism of a side branch opening is difficult. Also, uh, I after experiencing in this case, I think some if if I gonna do some uh, TK crush and we do and the first step of TK crush and the second wiring would be easy than uh, this like some balloon crushes. So my the plausible mech mechanics and mechanism for this case and uh, some diagonal osteum is a too much, you know, uh, protruded in the main branch would be some, one of the mechanism is that, uh, you know, guide wire cares. I'd love to hear from, no, those are great things because I think, I think the mechanism is on, not well understood. The angulation of this, of this uh, bifurcation could have played a role and there could have been some stent deformation as you, really pushed up against uh, um, with a very large balloon in that LAD. And, you know, if you think about it, it was really a very acute angle. And I think uh, that might have played a role, whether this was tissue versus thrombus, et cetera. You could have easily figured that out if you gave like some Tangrelore or something to see if it would go away. But let's hear from Jack Tan. Uh, what's your, what, what do you think happened here? And what, how would you approach something like this? Um, I'm, I, I think DW presented an excellent case. I, I'm not too sure of the mechanism, but the fact that he went to a very stiff CTO wire suggests to me that it wasn't just occluded by clots and tissue. Uh, more likely it's some form of stem malformation that I don't quite understand. Um, and it could be that the stem crushed back on itself, almost like back telescope when you reverse crush. Uh, one observation is that usually when I go for a two stem strategy, I will try to extend the main trunk stand a bit further back so I can be more comfortable with the pot. Uh, sometimes when I'm desperate, I will go with an even larger pot balloon, smaller, shorter, and do a, another pot to try to reverse the structure in the side branch and pot in before I look at it. Uh, I was then looking at the side branch excess might give me some clues, but I think the patient was having a chest pain and struggling. So I think it's a good bailout. Um, at that point, in terms of wiring tricks, uh, uh, Professor Rofi talked about supercross and all this, but the uh, uh, twin pass or crusade catheter is something I would try first. Uh, I would usually go with um, uh, hydrophilic wire in this case. And most times, if I'm concerned with angulated uh, two cent strategy, I leave a wire trapped because that gives me some support as well as a marker to recross. And if I'm desperate, I will slip a small balloon under the trapped wire to try to open up the side strut. So see, these are some of the things I would uh, do in this case, uh, but I'm not too sure of the mechanism, uh, but thanks DK. Uh, DK. Yeah, no, I think, I think this was really tough. I think there had to be something really stiff there in order to, uh, to explain this. Professor Chan, any thoughts um, on this? Andy. Yes, um, I think um, the main issue is we don't understand, we don't quite sure the mechanism. And um, I think the tissue prolapse is really a, 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 a possible thing that we have we did consider. And um, and uh, it's, it's difficult, but um, but I appreciate your effort in uh, doing all this. And I think it's a really great case and and um, uh, to learn, yeah. Any other thoughts? I'd love to hear. Um... Uh, from Professor Brian uh, P. Ying Yang. Hi, Rafael. Thank you for that. Um, again, I agree with Jack. I'm not quite sure about the mechanism, but I'm, uh, the fact you need a conquest well, probably makes thrombus a bit less likely. Because if you think it's thrombus, I would expect you'll be able to wipe more, more quickly. Mm -hmm. But so whether it's, I think some people mentioned whether it's just purely from a stent crush or from some calcium mm -hmm. or some other, maybe a a flap or tissue, but I mean, it's a great case. I think you've, 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 you've come up very well. Mm -hmm. So, but, mm -hmm. but 
Yes, anyone yeah. anyone want to? Yeah, I think it was very difficult. Any comments from anyone that we might have missed? Would you, you know, the one wire you didn't try is the whisper wire, but I don't think whisper would go because this, there was some crushed something in there. I, mm -hmm. I'm surprised. But but what was interesting is that after you put in the uh, the Conquest Pro and, and crossed, you were able to go in with an IVIS catheter, right? Uh, you were able to do that. So you would imagine you didn't have that much of a difficulty. Is that right? So, and uh, you know, some after the wiring, uh, the Conquest Pro, I put the, the LED anchoring and then the, the implantation using 1.0 and the smallest, uh, the wide, smallest balloon and then two and three time. And then I put the exchange the soft wire and then evaluate the eyebrows. One other point, uh, if I may, is that uh, Sometimes I do always go with a non-compliant balloon in the side branch to crank up mm. the osteum before mm. a balloon crush. Uh, the other point is that some of those more tighter mini crush, uh, you have to take note of the stand type. I'm not too sure about design, whether mm. the mm. there's some closed cell design right at the tip. Sometimes it can also uh, make it more difficult to rewire and recross. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, this was so, a really fantastic case. Maybe you can tell us what you did with the antiplatelet regimens. Uh, during and after and and whether or not with all of that chest pain in one hour was there a peri procedural infarction mm, 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 mm. so and uh, this this patient you know so we keep the ccu and the two days and the patient uh, absolutely stabilized at this time at the time of discharge we just pres prescribed the aspirin and the plavix uh, this patient was stable in gina yeah I think the aspirin plus Chicago letter would be some one of a very nice option, you know, on on the basis of trial and trial. Okay. Any other any other last thoughts? We we're gonna I'm gonna turn this right back to you, Dr. Chan. Thank you so much, Professor D. W. Park. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chan. And okay. Back to you. you. Uh, so. So, and the time is on is uh, I'm going to introduce then the case the three and the doctor, and the, uh, the, the, I'm going to introduce the third speaker, Dr. Carl Lung Chui, and from Hong Kong. And the Dr. Chui is associate the consultant and prince of the Wales Hospital. And uh, I hope that he presented the Wales is uh, one of the very complex cases. Dr. Chu, Dr. Chu, please. Uh, thank you very much for a kind introduction. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon, depending on where you are. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to make sure you see my screen and hear my voice. Okay, good, good. Do you nice. all, good, good, okay. That's great. So uh, my patient is a 69 years old uh, gentleman who is a smoker. He got history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, carotid artery stenosis with history of TIA in 2015 and subsequent left internal carotid artery stenting in 2019. And uh, he got ischemic heart disease with stable effort angina. And uh, the coronary angiogram show a left main of 60% stenosis with pressure damping or using the five French uh, diagnostic catheter. And uh, there's proximal to mid LAD 80% stenosis, diagonal diffuse 80 to 90% stenosis, and mid third focal 90% stenosis. And the mid RCA is minor disease and distal POE blanch having a small 60-70% uh, uh, stenosis. So we discussed with the patient about the option of CBG versus multi-vessel PCI and he opted for uh, PCI. So this is the coronary angiogram, the LAO cranial wheel showing the RCA and uh, there is uh, mid RCA minor disease and distal POE blanch uh, moderate to severe uh, stenosis. This is the RAO wheel showing the RCA, showing only minor disease in the mid portion of the RCA. So uh, because the coronary angiogram was done before, so I got the wall map uh, in the cat lab. So I go with the guiding. So uh, I usually don't do senior angiogram with the guiding because sometimes if you got bad left main disease and you inject contrast and do the senior angiogram with the guiding, you may end up dissecting the left main or dissecting, if you enter in the RCA, may dissect the RCA. So what I did is uh, pull up the angiogram uh, side by side and then I sit the guiding with the cut wire so that my guide did not engage the left main. 
and I wire the LED before I do this senior angiogram. So what you can see is uh, there is a moderate a severe stenosis in the left main. There's severe disease in the uh, proximal to mid LED, and there's severe disease in the diagonal branch, which is uh, quite a sizable diagonal. And there is a uh, focal, uh, sorry, there's a focal uh, stenosis in the mid circumflex. So um, this angle, the bifurcation angle is unfavorable. The disease of the diagonal is long and involving the ostium. So uh, my, my surgery is to do a two-stand technique for this uh, LAD D1 diagonal blanch. So what I did is use a more uh, true old balloon to predilate the diagonal and also the LAD. I do IFAS to both the LAD and also the diagonal blanch. And then I put a 225 long DS uh, just slightly protruding into the LED. And I park the uh, LED with a uh, 3 O balloon, NC balloon. And then I crush the stand after the stand deployment. So this is the stand deployment. I post dilate with a 225 and 25 balloon. And then uh, I park a 35 long DS from left main to mid LED. So this is the result. So I rewire the diagonal and post dilate the LED with a 3.5 NC balloon distally, and then I 4O balloon uh, in the left main. And then I do the uh, uh, balloon post dilatation to the diagonal. So I found difficulty in passing the uh, 2.5 used NC balloon and also the 2O balloon. So I use a new uh, 2.5 NC balloon, but however, it's passed too easily. And actually, without my notice, I keep on pushing the balloon. And finally, I noticed that the guiding actually back off. And uh, I pull back the balloon and then do the balloon post dilatation to the diagonal. And then final kissing balloon in the LED D1 diagonal. So this is the uh, kissing balloon inflation at the LAD and D1. And uh, this is the pot in the left main using the 4O balloon. So this is the result. So what you notice is there is a LS type 3 perforation in the uh, distal diagonal branch. And it's most likely caused by my balloon. Actually, uh, because the used NC balloon cannot pass the side branch, and uh, I use a new NC balloon and it actually went too smoothly without my notice and I got like uh, some poor eyesight maybe and the balloon actually passed beyond the wire tip and caused a LOS type 3 uh, distal perforation. So, uh, so what you need to do uh, at first is to put a balloon to occult the D1. So I put back the 2-5 balloon and inflate at low pressure and so as to uh, buy it some time. So I, at the same time, I check an ACT. Of course, I don't uh, want to reverse heparin at this juncture because I still got some gear in the uh, coronary system. So what I did is uh, give the patient fluid and uh, also uh, set up an IV access, the central wing access in the frame wall. And then I do the, but the patient cannot tolerate the uh, balloon, prolong, prolong balloon uh, tamponade. So uh, I have to defray it on and off to relieve the symptom of ischemia because there's at the same time some ST elevation in the lateral leaks. So because of this bad dissection, I don't think a balloon uh, dilatation, a, a balloon uh, occlusion is going to stop the bleeding. So what I did is uh, prepare the coiling. So uh, I did it in a, not a correct way, but I will show you what I did. So uh, this is the microcatheter. I accidentally lost my LED wire and uh, the microcatheter is in the diagonal branch. So I deployed two coil. So this is the first coil, still ongoing extrasation. For some reason, I cannot detach the coil. So I have to retrieve it back and I king the microcatheter at the same time. So I changed to a fine course into the diagonal branch. So this is the contrast injection through the microcatheters. You see the active extrasation, a very bad distal uh, dissection by the balloon tips. So I prepare the coil again and put one coil. It seems still uh, ongoing extrasation. And patient become very uh, unstable with systolic blood pressures only uh, 80. So I try to did an echo and it's only very tiny amount of uh, pericardial effusion that I cannot, uh, I mean, reliably tap it. So I give some intracoronary adrenaline to push the blood pressure and give some more fluid. And uh, while at the same time, uh, put in one more call and see. 
So I deploy one more coil down, and this is a second coil, a two by uh, 10 uh, millimeter coil. I did the uh, coronary uh, injection through the microcatheter, still ongoing um, uh, extravasation. So uh, it's very uh, in patient with acute uh, tamponade, it's not uncommon that it's only accumulation of very small amount of pericardial blood can result in profound hemodynamical suppression or even PGA arrest. And pericardial synthesis in this uh, situation is very difficult. And there is a risk of uh, puncturing the RV free wall by the, your puncture needle. So uh, what I use nowadays uh, for very little, I mean, pericardial effusion. So I was use a micropuncture set. Even if you puncture with the RV with this micropuncture set, it's usually sealed off and uh, not so difficultly. Because I've encountered cases that I use a 21 gauge needle that puncture the ROV and then subsequently the bleeding stop, but the ROV continue to bleed and the patient has to have an open heart re repair of the ROV. So uh, from that time onwards, I changed my practice. Uh, Sometimes I use a micropuncture needle if there's not much fluid in the uh, echo. So I punctured a few times and successfully get the access. I, I used the inner sheath of the microcatheter to drill in and then use the agitated saline method to confirm my position before I dilated with the dilator and also the insert the pigtail. So uh, after accessing the uh, pericardium, I aspirate the blood pressure immediately improved. And I also, because I got a central wing access, I do the auto transfusion by using a three-way lunar stop clock with male-to-male -male connector. You have to stop some male-to-male -male connector in your cat lab to connect the pigtail to the uh, femoral wing sheath. And this limits the lead for blood transfusion and also the potential uh, massive transfusion related complication. But if you do that, you must have a therapeutic ACT, not too high and not too low, because there is chance of uh, getting some thrombus injected it back into the circulation. So after the uh, uh, pericardial synthesis and uh, some more time, actually uh, it, the hemostasis was achieved and uh, no further bleeding. So uh, I, I actually, the way I did this is not correct. What I think back is uh, I should keep the balloon tamponade in D1, actually use the LED wire or another wire to wire the diagonal branch and keep the in balloon inflated during that time. Only if you uh, wire the at D1, you deflate the balloon and wire quickly and then to inflate the balloon again. And you load the microcatheter over the new D1 wire and then use the D1 balloon as a trapping balloon that you can push your microcatheter to your target site and quickly deflate, advance, and then inflate the balloon back. It helps to keep the balloon off time minimal so, so as to while uh, attempting the coil. So uh, if you need, you can inject contrast via the microcatheter. And coil can be delivered while keeping the balloon inflated. So that, that you will keep the uh, uh, bleeding minimal if you have proximal uh, perforation, then you can use ping pong guiding. So if you have distal perforation like this, actually you could keep the balloon, use a second wire. And this helped to keep the balloon off time minimal. And uh, so that the patient won't went into a like tamponade situation, very, very uh, uh, tra traumatic to me. So if you had distal perforation, if unstable, call for help and inflate the proximal balloon, prepare for pericardial synthesis. And if the patient is stable, you can, we could uh, check uh, if balloon tamponade can work. But if in this kind of uh, big perforation, not wire perforation, most of the time you need to do something. So if it fails to seal, you could consider like uh, microcall, fat emboli, uh, clotted autologous blood, form beans, etc. If it's sealed, then you uh, okay. If it's not, then you go through either a uh, other set or even using other other things. Or if the distal bifurcation is in the side branch, you could cover the main branch uh, with a cover sand, but this would lose the diagonal branch. And But reversing, consider reversing the heparin only when you remove everything uh, because there's risk of uh, clot in the main branch. So this ends my presentation. Thank you for your kind attention. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chu. And uh, this is a very the wonderful case presentation. I think that this is a very a uh, lot of things that we run the, from the, this case set. So, and the discussion and panel and any comment or any question to the presenter?
maybe a quick comment about the tap. I think uh, in the smallish tap, uh, I try to use a tuning needle. What the EP does for a dry pericardial tap, that's fairly safe as well. The other, the other thing I want to ask Dr. Tree is that the technique you show gave me a wonderful idea. It was a great sharing. Uh, if you have it trapped, would you consider balloon up and then injecting thrombin? Uh, then it seems quite safe. If you have a balloon guarding the LED and then just using thrombin rather than coils, would that be uh, something you'll consider? Uh... Actually, if you inject thrombin, then uh, it's unpredictable. If you coil, you can uh, be more predictable. I mean, uh, you, you can see there's a small bunch, one in a superior one and then inferior one. If you coil both, or uh, then the whole diagonal will go from both because of no outflow. So I have to coil as distal as possible. And coil is, the, the advantage is it's controllable and you can sear it. If it doesn't uh, look good, then you can retrieve it. If you do fat emboli, if the fat is big and then it locks, up in the bifurcation, then you lost the whole diagonal branch. And if you inject from bin, there's a chance of spillation. I, I have no experience with using the from bin. So, so probably I would still try to use call if available in my shell. If it doesn't available, probably I would consider uh, fat or even the y core wire. I mean, the absorbable coronary, I mean, the absorbable stitch that you could like just like described by Dr. Lam Ho. And uh, actually you can do something, I mean, fetch would be my choice. And I don't have foam bean in my lab and uh, probably a call would be my first choice because I'm more familiar with, with this. Okay, Dr. Lam, and could you do, do you comment, Dr. Simon Lam or Dr. Ho Lam, and any, any comment for this case? Uh, oh, yes, and so maybe uh, Lam Ho first. Uh, uh, I think uh, Dr. Choi, uh, your case is great. Uh, you have demonstrated the use of micropuncture set for those pericardial synthesis. That is uh, some very important technique because uh, in the early phase of those digital perforation, uh, they, they, the pericardial effusion may be just very small, but still can be so in tempo now. The use of these micropuncture sets may help a lot. Um, uh, as you mentioned, for this case, uh, in the old day, I will also struggle. But uh, in now, nowadays, uh, next time you try, just use the uh, absorbable wire, wire code, and then you will left nothing. You just uh, put the microcapital uh, down and then uh, inject and then localize the perforation site and then push uh, 3 mm or 4 mm uh, absorbable VO wire code down and maybe in your case, because it's not perforated by wire, but by balloon, so probably they may, you may need uh, six times or eight times uh, just push the wire code in. Uh, we had tried a few cases recently, all okay. And in your case, there are one tips and tricks I want to share. I see you push the microcapital down to the point of perforation and then inject the contrast. Uh, sometimes that can aggregate the perforation. So, um, uh, usually, I will uh, take the microcapita uh, uh, maybe three to five uh, uh, centimeter, uh, take, uh, take it up a bit away from the perforation side and then inject the contrast so that you won't aggregate the uh, uh, perforation. Uh, that is my sharing. Okay. And, and for me, and yes, actually, I agree. Yeah. So learn from this case, and uh, I think for these scenarios, it's just to use something that you're very, really familiar with. I think uh, learning to use the co uh, coils and also the uh, absorbable sutures, but for me, the fastest thing to use is, is the fat uh, embolization and control the size. So it really depends on what you're really familiar with and to help the patient um, as soon as possible. And for the uh, puncture set, I think with the x-ray, it's very easy to do, even there's a very minimal... Um, Effusion, you can uh, use the wire to confirm. You can do a, a little bit injections, even for dry, dr we are trained for dry tap for uh, structural intervention. So I think with X-ray, you can really confirm even there is any very small effusion. And last word is for the auto transfusion. I have some uh, hesitation because sometimes for some patients, mm. uh, I have experienced that it triggers some immune phenomenon that really the patient goes into the IC or anything. If you mm. really a lingering process, I still prefer food resuscitation, timely uh, tapping, and uh, uh, call for blood pack cell transfusion. So for, for me, if there's any perceiving, I mean, anticipating complication, I will do the tapping really early on. 
main for structural yeah, yeah. heart intervention and for PCIs. Yeah, definitely. There is, a, as a, my, my the question is the same. You know, some we do during the very urgent PCI or urgent top up procedure, we sometimes do the auto transfusion. But, you know, uh, anesthesiology doctor is very, you know, concerned about the safety of auto transfusion. Is any, any sort of the panel or, you know, discussion about the auto transfusion? Yeah, I, I fully agree that uh, that actually it, it may seem that the, at the very first uh, site it may seem a very elegant uh, option, uh, but uh, indeed uh, I have also great concern about uh, this uh, DIC-like process. So actually, uh, I do not perform auto transfusion anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the Dr. Law, Sidney Law, any any comment for this case? I, I, was, I was just going to comment that most of the cases just means the operator has to be very comfortable with doing these procedures. Uh, Pericastentesis is a must. So, and also uh, ability to stop stop the uh, bleeding, particularly perforation in terms of coiling or fat embolization. I think one of my friends told me, you know, uh, most patients have some fat in the groin, and so it's hypoallergenic, and you don't leave anything behind. And so essentially it looks pretty good if it works. And so I think that if we, uh, as operators, particularly junior doctors, learn how to do this so they're not freaked out when they're doing this in an emergency situation. Uh, I know the EP doctors do the pericastentesis in a different way. They do in a lateral view. And I think that we just need to know how we're going to do it with a micropuncture kit and that everything's available. So we, in my lab, we now have a, a pericastentesis trolley. So it just gets wheeled. Everything is there. And we don't have to run away. The nurse is not running away. It's all there and it's all available so that you don't freak out. It's, it's all confident. And, and of course, a hemostatic uh, trolley as well with all the coils, microcatheters, everything is in one place and it's always available. Uh, one okay. final point I want to uh, make for the uh, micropuncture sac is usually the needle is uh, shorter. I mean, you, you may, for obese patient, you may not be long enough. The other thing is the Y is short. And uh, if you want to come confirm with x-ray, it's not easy with the micropuncture wire because you can't insert the wire all the way to see the, actually the wire go through the anterior posterior and left and right a different chamber. So what you need to do is do agitated saline to confirm before you actually dilating the track. I mean, this is a must. I mean, the wire is not long enough and, uh, mm -hmm. and also the needle mm -hmm. sometimes is short. It's only for thin patient. Yeah. Yeah. I think the micropuncture uh, yeah. technique was, uh, was pioneered by the, the Mayo Clinic. So in their paper, mm -hmm. that 1,500 cases, they mm -hmm. were basically apical tap. So that was the preferred approach. So it's not so, not so long. So you're right. If you're doing sub for it, it's not a subcostal approach. Mm -hmm. It may be too short in a large patient. And something I learned from Eric and my colleague and a good friend and is that you can use a, a, 0 .18, a 0 0.018 wire and to, to do the process, I mean, a longer wire, because the, the wire that uh, that goes with the pack is, is very bad. I mean, the transition, the soft part and the hard part is very bad, it's kinked easily. And so I would use another better 0 0.018 wire. Mm -hmm. That's just so, like steel core, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I think one of the important educational point of this case and any any PCI procedure is I, I recommend for our junior is to keep the all wire to end of the branch, you know, at the end of a branch and diagonal end of a branch. And the, if the keep the, uh, uh, the, you know, stabilize the wire and the end of the branch and the, we avoid the, such like a complication, you know, the procedure. Okay. Uh, can I one comment? Okay, great. Yes, uh, so uh, I have one comment about the hemostasis maybe. Uh, can I share one picture? Okay, okay, you can, yes, you can uh, share so, one picture. Uh, okay. Yes, yes. Uh, can you see this paper? So this is uh, my published paper. So mm. maybe for putting the call, he uh, uh, concerned about the uh, bleeding or stop, stop bleeding. So with uh, prolonged barrel inflation like this. So if we put the micro catheter uh, to put the call like this, so deflate uh, immediately and put the micro catheter and wire here. And in this paper, I, uh, talked about so severe uh, at the severe uh, population, we can inject the patient mm. arterial blood for distal part so we can perfuse uh, arterial flow. So we mm. can perform very long uh, balloon inflation more than 20 minutes. So I performed this uh, procedure uh, a few cases. So it was very effective. So not mm. only injecting arterial blood, but may. Uh, 
uh, putting uh, thrombus or putting mm -hmm. cards, it is very effective. So that I uh, mentioned. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Thank you. Okay, so and the time is on, and the, we're gonna move to the case number four, and uh, I'm gonna introduce uh, Dr. Ralph P. Sharma, and from United States, and uh, he is the director of the structural intervention and Stanford Healthcare, and the clinical assistant of a professor of medicine at Stanford University, and Dr. Sharma is interventional cardiologist with a specialized uh, clinical and research interest in the structural heart disease. Uh, Dr. Sharma. Thank you, Professor yeah. Park and colleagues. Uh, thank you for the kind invitation. I hope you can see my screen and hear me okay. Okay, great. Terrific. So I'm gonna change the, uh, the cadence and the flavor a little bit from complex coronary intervention to a uh, complex structural intervention. Um, and uh, this is my most thrilling case, at least recently. We have plenty of thrilling cases, but uh, hopefully this one uh, is somewhat entertaining and instructive. So this is a patient a little younger than we're used to seeing in, in structural heart. This is a 30 year old, very unfortunate female. You can see here a very complex, extensive uh, list of comorbidities. She had AML at age seven, um, had chemotherapy, whole body radiation, um, had multiple complications as a result of her, both her primary disease as well as her treatment. She had uh, lung disease, significant graft versus host disease. She had uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, ended up on end stage dialysis. In, a, in a secondary to end-stage dialysis, had systemic calciphylaxis, and we'll see why that is important shortly. Um, bilateral lower uh, limb osteomyelitis with digital amputations. She had a papillary thyroid carcinoma and multiple thromboembolic complications with visual loss and, and uh, digital um, infarcts, as well as DVTs and PEs. And she had an issue of chronic hypotension, which was particularly worse on hemodialysis and was on medications to try and control that. Complicating all of her treatment, she en ended up having a chemotherapy-induced cardiomyopathy with significant symptoms and orthopnea. She had an initial improvement in her ejection fraction once her regimen was uh, altered, but eventually uh, had worsening of her ejection fraction and hypotension on those dialysis days. She had repeated echoes done throughout her treatment, and these show these fluctuating echogenic masses of calcification seen in the left side of the heart, on the right atrium and the septum, and involving the mitral leaflet with moderate to severe mitral regurgitation. So she was admitted to hospital with a worsening in her ejection fraction, worsening of her symptoms and degree of MR. And after consultation with the multidisciplinary team, a thought was given to pursue intervention in the mitral valve as a last effort to improve her quality of life. She was seen by the surgeons, of course, and they thought given her high surgical mortality, a percutaneous approach would be better tolerated than surgery. And so this is her baseline echocardiogram. You can see here significant calcification, um, the caudal structures, the, uh, the wall of the ventricle here. Um, you can see echogenic masses flicking around on the mitral leaflet and the thickened mitral leaflets as well. And you can see here, she has mitral annual calcification and uh, significant mitral regurgitation extending all the way back to the left atrium. So we elected to perform a mitral clip procedure with a degree of trepidation. Given all of that calcium there, I uh, used a cerebral protection device with the sentinel cerebral protection. Um, and in the usual way from the right radial approach through a six French sheath and articulating the two baskets to sit in the right innominate. And then the second basket you can see here in the left common carotid artery. Given the fact that we were going to be instrumenting the left side and we didn't know what would happen to those echogenic masses, we thought it most prudent to protect her brain. So she also had a tunnel dialysis catheter, um, which I'd never encountered to be a problem before, but in this case made it extremely difficult to try and perform the transeptal puncture. The tunnel dialysis catheter was actually sitting right in front of the septum. So despite the use of multiple uh, modalities to perform the transeptal, you see here I'm using the SL1 catheter, which is my first go-to, but despite the use of an SL1 and an agilis and multiple other catheters, the the actual tunnel dialysis catheter was sitting right in front of the septum, you can see here in the panel on the right, so I could never get onto the septum. And so what we did is we asked the uh, interventional radiologist to come in, pull out the tunnel dialysis catheter. And we all learned something that day, and that is that even though you pull out the catheter, after a catheter has been in for some time, there is a residual fibrin encasing around the catheter, which actually can be quite firm. And so what you see here on the 3D image, as well as on the 2D image, is actually the tunnel catheter is out that this is the residual fibrin casing around that catheter. And so still there was a mechanical obstruction to performing the transeptal puncture. And so you see here, I now have an agilis catheter thinking if I have more support, I'll be able to get around it. 
but in fact, there's still a mechanical obstruction between the agilis catheter and the septum. And so thinking sort of on the spot, uh, what I decided to do in consultation with my IR colleagues is actually to balloon fragment the fibrin sheath. And so I wired the balloon sheath and actually ballooned it and uh, broke up the fibrin casing uh, that was obstructing the passage to the septum. And now you see here, there's some residual fibrin material flicking around, but now we have a very clear run to the septum um, with no mechanical obstruction to the septum. And so this time with the agilis catheter uh, against the septum, you can appreciate that the septum is quite bright as a result of the calcification. It was very rigid and very thick. For those of you who do a lot of transeptal procedures, you'll appreciate that a lot of time we get mechanical tactile feedback from the septum and you can actually feel the pulsation while you're on the septum. There was no such tactile feedback here uh, due to the calcification. You can also appreciate that the degree of tenting is very subtle, again, because it's a very rigid septum. And so again, I'm using the agilis catheter here for additional support and the BRK needle would not puncture. So I did something a little bit unorthodox. I took a stiff end of an 035 wire, the back end of an 035 wire and passed it through the agilis catheter and actually electrified the back end of the 035 wire. And so you can see here that was successful in puncturing through this rigid septum. Uh, what I then did is very carefully exchange that rigid wire using a mic full French micro catheter. And you can see here just very carefully advancing it and twisting it, just sort of spinning it through that septum so that that stiff wire didn't jump through and perforate the posterior wall. And then you can see here the soft full French catheter into the pulmonary vein and then we exchanged over that. Did a balloon septostomy. Again, this is not routine uh, in my practice for a mitral clip. More often than not, you have a supple soft septum. And so passage of even a 24 French mitral clip system through that is not a problem. But again, given the difficulties we faced with traversing the septum in this case, elected to perform a balloon septostomy here with a 12 millimeter balloon, just very slow inflation to ensure that we wouldn't get hung up with the mitral clip delivery system across that septum after all of this hard work. Now, I will tell you, getting to this point had taken about two and a half hours, which again is not routine for a transeptal puncture. So thereafter, we advanced the mitral clip in the routine fashion um, and, you know, not really knowing how, what to expect with grasping these leaflets, given the degree of calcification and given the degree of those echogenic masses. And so that was fairly routine in terms of traversing the mitral clip under careful uh, TEE guidance to ensure we did not get caught up in those calcified cords or knock off any of that calcium. And you can see here, this is us trying to grasp the leaflets, um, being very careful to try and avoid a lot of this calcium, but you can see there the anterior and the post anterior leaflet on the right, posterior leaflet on the left, uh, ensuring that we have adequate leaflet all the way into the V um, before gently closing this under guidance. And so you can see here, we've closed the clip and there's a significant reduction in the mitral regurgitation, very little residual mitral regurgitation there. But of course we wanna be very careful because sometimes we can mitigate all of the mitral regurgitation and then end up with significant mitral stenosis. And given the calcification here, that was certainly a concern. We we're very pleased to see that her residual gradient was only four millimeters of mercury. And so we elected to deploy the clip and um, you can see here the uh, on fast view, we have the uh, still that chunk of um, likely thrombogenic or calcified material here on the posterior aspect is still there. It hasn't gone anywhere and um, we've credited this uh, kind of Al Fiori approach with a double orifice mitral valve with very little mitral regurgitation uh, left through there. And again, we weren't sure how this clip would behave post deployment with the tension on this leaflet and the nature of the tissue, leaflet tissue. And so we we're very pleased to see that after deployment, we still had very little residual mitral regurgitation. We were left with this iatrogenic ASD, uh, which is not infrequent when we do these transeptal procedures. I would say the majority of the time when we have a left to right shunt in the absence of any bi-directional or right to left shunting in the absence of desaturation, we tend to leave these alone. However, given the, the patient's prior history of multiple thromboembolic events um, and her tenuous state, we actually elected to close this iatrogenic ASD, not because of any hemodynamic issues, but rather to protect from any potential thrombogenic issues going forward. My preference for device use is the Gore device. It's a very simple device. It comes in two sizes, a 25 and a 30 millimeter device. Very simple to deploy. It's effectively one large coil, which creates uh, two discs with a PET material fabric throughout. And you can see there, we've successfully closed that ASD and there's no flow through the, the device or around the device. We used a 25 millimeter device here. 
And so we retrieved the Sentinel and you can see here, there is quite a lot of foreign material. Um, I think, you know, there's a lot of controversy about the use of cerebral protection, certainly in TAVA, but in this case, I, I think it was the right thing to do. And you can see there's quite a lot of dense material there. I'm sure if we sent that off for analysis, we would found, found that uh, it was probably a mix of immune complex, tissue material and calcium. And so the patient did quite well, was discharged two days after, uh, after the procedure. Her main complaint was back pain from lying in bed for too long. Um, but continues to do well now. This is three months after the procedure uh, with no rehospitalizations for heart failure. And so this is just to show you the side-by-side -side comparison of uh, what we started with and what we ended up with after one clip in the mitral position. So I'll stop there and uh, take any questions or comments. Okay, Thank great. You. Great. Thank you, Dr. Sama. This is a very complex and uh, that this is a very wonderful case. Any comment from the panel or discussion for this nice case? So thank you very much, uh, Professor Sharma. So um, uh, may I ask how often do you use um, sentinel protection in non tavi cases? So for example, we, we may do uh, sometimes do mitral um, procedures, for example, PBMV, we found there may be a lot of clots or degeneration, or sometimes we do valve in valve uh, mitral prosthesis, in which there may be a lot of uh, calcium debris. So we may do it, uh, but sometimes we really can catch something. So how, what is the threshold of using uh, the protection device in non tavi cases? Yes, that's a great question. Uh, my personal preference is I'm a strong believer in cerebral protection, both in the TAVA and non TAVA space. Um, however, I need to balance my, my own uh, preferences and desires um, with health economics, and it is an off-label use, of course. And in the United States, while we have a new technology add-on payment for it, uh, there is still an out-of-pocket expense. So I'm unable to use it in all cases, but similar to what you just described, um, very calcified, um, any, any sort of material we see on the left side that could be thrombogenic. Um, so those complicated uh, valve in valves, I don't use it so much for valve and ring, I certainly use it uh, when I'm doing any valve and MAC procedure, um, whether that's a TMVR or a sapien valve in, in the mitral position. And um, I think, you know, as we have better devices and, and more evidence, we might see it being used more often in non-TAVI left-sided procedures as well. Thank you. Great. Yeah, I have a uh, 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 yeah. Go ahead, Roxana. Oh, okay, okay. Roxana. Um, I, an amazing case and uh, a difficult one. I'm still struggling with whether or not, um, with all of the things that's going on in this patient, whether or not you needed to close that AST to give her yet another device uh, inside yes. of her body. Um, yeah. And I wondered, you know, access to this mitral valve the next time, if, if let's just say she, um, another reason to go across that septum, et cetera might be really, really difficult, almost impossible. She's only 30 years old. So I'd like to hear your rationale for closing that um, ASD. Yeah, great question, Roxana. Um, while I presented it very quickly from slide to slide, that decision took a lot of deliberation in the lab. And um, we went back and forth for quite some time. All those points you raised were, were discussed and thought about, you know, the, the need for reintervention, the need to reaccess the septum. Um, as I said, it's not our routine to close these, particularly looking at those echo images. In any other case, we would have left this alone. Um, I think there was a, a great pressure, both from her referring and, and some of the others in the room, in that she'd had so many thromboembolic complications that, you know, if there was any hemodynamic situation under which that shunt reversed, um, you know, this a stroke would be catastrophic in this young lady. So I think, you know, I agree. It's 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 certainly not uh, the right decision one way or another. Um, and I think on balance, at the end of it, I decided that the the, the chances or of us going back in for another left side procedure were fairly low. This was kind of her last ditch attempt. Um, no one really wanted to instrument her again. The surgeons certainly weren't going to touch her. She's not a transplant candidate at this mm -hmm. stage. And so this was really a for more for a symptomatic benefit to keep her out of hospital and therefore the chance of a repeat intervention are low and i thought the chances of a, a stroke um, you know albeit small were probably um kind of larger than that and so in the end we decided to close it but but you're absolutely right you know whether it's the right decision or not i'm not sure but on balance that we, we felt it was the the right thing at the time yeah maybe in yeah. this respect uh, i assume that the patient based on the uh, heavy background of uh, of multiple dvts and pe was the patient anticoagulated? This is my, fir my first question. And the, the second is uh, just a comment. Uh, we don't have a, don't have, do not have a restriction in Switzerland currently for 
EPD in, in Tower. So we use it in our center routinely for Tower and for selected uh, mitral procedures such as uh, uh, valve in, uh, in bioprosthesis. Fantastic. So to answer your question, yes, she was an anticoagulation. In fact, some of her thromboembolic events had occurred while on anticoagulation. So she, she was quite a high risk patient in terms of thromboembolic events. So I, I, I do you have any comment, Gary? Okay, go ahead. Okay, Dr. Uh, Chair. Oh, uh, I'm asking uh, Dr. Gary Jern, do you have any comment? Dr. Jern is our uh, structural heart disease uh, expert. Uh, you have to unmute the microphone. Yes, hi, thank you, Dr. Chen. Yeah, uh, it's a good case. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I think it's a good case. Um, I, uh, I noticed that uh, this is not a routine to use a uh, uh, protection device to in this much of um, trip pace because uh, usually there's no much uh, thought that we can retrieve from this um, trip pace. case. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we noticed that um, Otavio, of course, will use uh, carpet. To, to, for every topic case. But in this uh, situation, uh, uh, there is a so where that we will achieve a lot of cost. So where do you think the, the location or the source of the cost from the carrots? So, so I, I, think, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, sorry, this background noise. The question was, where do you think the source of this, the material was from this Sentinel? Is that the question? Yeah. Okay. So, so um, our, our thought, and, and we set yes, this off yes. for histopathology. Uh, sorry, our thought, and we sent this off for confirmatory histopathology, was that it was likely a material from the uh, from the the valve itself, um, and there was actually a mix of thrombus, some calcified material, and some leaflet tissue as well. So it was a it was basically from the valve itself. Um, there might have been something from the transeptal puncture to account for the the, the, the calcified fragments, but um, I think most of it from was from the valve itself. Yeah, I think yeah. so because when you pass the uh, system through the septum and also do cracking, then you may stretch a lot of things to go into the LA. Uh, another thing that for, for the for the valve itself, because you only touch the valve when you clip, so I think the contact of the the system to the valve is less compared with what you manipulate around uh, in uh, along the septum. So I think, I mean, why not put in a embolic protection device and this certainly helps the patient in this sense. Mm -hmm. But don't, don't forget, we are, we are talking about the ASD and the, um, and the, uh, and the, um, uh, and, and, and the correlation or anything. But uh, I think most importantly, this, this is a difficult case for the mitral clip mm -hmm. because you only have very small margin. You have a calcium there. You want to avoid that. You want to balance between uh, residual stenosis and uh, the elimination of mitral, mitral irritation. So um, overall, it's a trying case for a mitral clip. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Sharma and my chain. It's a um, nice case. I think Great. I would um, like to we have uh, 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 about your okay. transeptal uh, puncture. Uh, it's a very uh, difficult uh, transeptal puncture. I presume that you have tried the uh, extra sharp uh, needle. Another option would be uh, the uh, radio frequency uh, 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 transeptal needle that may help if you your lab have uh, stopped that. Yes, so um, we, we actually tried the Bayless radio frequency needle, but the, the needle itself didn't quite have the strength to get across. The radio frequency part wasn't a problem, it was just pushing through that septum. And so that's why I ended up using the back end of the stiff wire, just to have that mechanical force in addition to the RF ablation applied to it uh, with a bovie on the back end but absolutely we we have access our ep colleagues use that routinely i don't use it routinely i use it in difficult cases um but generally my go-to is the sl1 and brk1 but absolutely thank you dr jensen you have some comment okay yeah. Boy, uh, yes uh, yeah i have some comment. if i do the case i think uh, can you hear me? 
Can you hear me? I, yes. I'm sorry, it's very distorted. Yes, because it I, I seems that uh, the shun is left to right, and there's a lot of left hand, uh, right to left side. In this situation, sorry. Um, sorry. I'm can sorry. I... Can you hear me now? Yes, better. Uh, can you hear me now? Sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Sorry. Yes, yes, please speak. Yes. I, I, yeah, can you hear me now? Okay, Dr. Chu and the, your internet yeah, connection hi, is English. very unstable. Uh, for, for me. For me, I, I room close. Yeah, sorry. Usually I will observe this um, before close the AST closure. Usually I will, I will close the AST after the virtual kit if there's a right to left shunt and also if there's any desaturation after the virtual kit. So uh, if I prefer, I think I will observe in order to close the AST directly. So uh, this is my opinion for your, your case. Then also, of course, uh, to see the any desaturation if uh, I remove the cap. Yeah. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah. Maybe Dr. Jensen, you have some comment? Yes, thank you. Um, it was a great case, Dr. Sharma. Um, I really enjoyed it. I do a lot of mitoclips myself, but uh, experienced a couple of problems and uh, doing transeptal, but never had a like a fibrous channel in front of the, the septum. So um, as I understand correctly, you, you fragmented it, you shattered it with a, with a balloon. And out of curiosity, what, what, what did you do with the, with the, with the fragments? Did you, did you snare them? Did you uh, get a forceps and, and took them out or? No, so, so the, the IRF team felt that they, they do this apparently a lot um, when they're replacing these tunnel catheters. And they were saying that they just fragment away. They don't usually do anything for them. Um, you could see on that echo, there was a few um, adherent strands still there. We elected right. to leave them alone. We were very careful as we were crossing and doing our transeptal not to take any of those strands across. We were being very careful under TE, but we, we left it alone. We did, we did nothing for that right side. Okay, great. So next time when I um, experience a tunnel, then uh, I know what to do. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that was my first time too. Sorry, but in, in this respect, uh, what balloon size did you use? Because I mean, the superior vena cava is a quite large vessel. Yes. No. So we just chose the balloon size based on the fibrin sheath size of the, of the, around the tunnel dialysis, dialysis catheter. Um, and so I think we used a 12 or a 14 balloon. Okay, okay, great. So any, any comment from Ketchum? Okay, I think the time is up. Uh, I'm gonna move the, uh, the discussion role in my button to the, uh, Marco Lopi. Could you please introduce and the uh, fifth uh, speaker? Yes, first of all, uh, let me thank uh, uh, the Hong Kong Co College of Cardiology and his uh, president, uh, Dr. Chan, for this kind invitation, as well as the course director, Dr. Chan, Dr. Simon Lan, and Dr. Holam. It's a really a pleasure and honor for me here today. And uh, it is also my privilege to introduce uh, Professor Tegu Santoso. He's from Jakarta, Indonesia, Ministra Hospital. And he uh, was trained uh, in Indonesia and then at the Thorax Center. He's professor of internal medicine. And he has a variety, a wide variety of interests in the field of interventional cardiologists going from coronary to peripheral to structural heart disease and even stem cell. So really a very uh, broad uh, um, skill uh, panorama. He got uh, multiple awards and it is my pleasure to invite him uh, to present this case. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Rofi. And first of all, uh, I would like also to uh, thank the organizing committee for having me uh, joining this uh, very prestigious uh, webinar. In particular, also Dr. Uh, Simon Lam. Uh, this case is a this is a case of catheter-induced aortic dissection, Stanford type A, Dunning class three, with occlusive spiral dissection of the right coronary artery and perforation. Uh, allow me first to uh, review uh, risk conditions for these uh, situations. Uh, of course, uh, one of the uh, risk 
predisposing uh, factor for this is long-standing hypertension, which may uh, be associated with smoking, dyslipidemia, cocaine usage, and crack. And also connective tissue disorders. Uh, nowadays, uh, we are uh, dealing with a lot of patients with bicuspid aortic valve, which has a, a aortic, uh, often has the aortopathy also as well. And uh, another uh, situation related to connective tissue disorders are, among others, uh, Marfan syndrome, uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, vascular uh, inflammatory uh, disease, and so on, uh, deceleration trauma. But uh, in this uh, particular uh, occasion, I would like to uh, present a case uh, uh, which I presented with a catheter and instrument-induced uh, uh, section. Uh, according to the literature, uh, acute proximal aortic dissection is highly lethal with a high mortality rate. And the most, the most common causes of death are aortic rupture, stroke, myocardial infarction, circulatory failure, cardiac tamponade, and visceral ischemia. It carries a high mortality and uh, it is usually considered a surgical emergency. And the mortality is very high despite medical or surgical intervention. And uh, now, uh, this is the uh, uh, classifications of iotrogenic uh, aortic dissection. This, uh, this classification is uh, proposed by Dunning, but still adopted until now. Uh, he classified the iotrogenic aortic dissection into three types, grade one, if uh, uh, the dissection involves only ipsilateral cusps, class two, ipsilateral cusps extending to the aorta but less than 40 uh, mm from the dissected, uh, dissected uh, uh, spot, and class three, if it extends up to more than 40 mm from the dissection. And, uh, uh, iatrogenic aortic dissection is more common in cases undergoing PCI, slightly more common as com uh, compared to those undergoing a uh, diagnostic cat, slightly more common in uh, patients with, uh, presented with AMI, and right coronary artery also more common than uh, left because of the uh, a smaller size of the right coronary artery and less uh, left main intervention. And the risk factors are as follows, uh, heavy vessel calcifications, vigorous contrast injection, stiff aggressive guiding catheter manipulation, stiff, uh, the use of stiff or penetrating wires, non-coaxial guide position relative to the vessel wall. And the treatment include conservative uh, management, the use of stand or covered stand to seal the, the section entry and surgical repair, especially if we are dealing with a class at Dunning class three. The mechanism of hemodynamic uh, decompensations are as follows, aortic ruptures, perforations into the pericardium and tamponade, coronary uh, occlusion of the ostium and contralateral uh, ostium with hematoma, propagation of dissection into aortic arch, which may induce stroke, and dissecting uh, aorta, which may induce visceral ischemia, acute aortic regurge and acute uh, aortic occlusion because of false lumen. Treatment, of course, uh, we don't have clear management guidelines. Guidelines, uh, 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 guidelines are lacking. Then in class three are more likely to need, to need uh, surgical intervention. And this condition is increasingly uh, being managed uh, conservatively. And uh, this is uh, the surgical indications. Usually surgery is uh, uh, indicated in the presence if we have an uh, intimal flap, hemopericardium, hemodynamic instability, coronary ostium occlusion, and arch occlusion. And this is the case. 47 young female. The history is stable in Jaina since one year. Risk factors, hypertension, dyslipidemia, and history of hysterectomy. Uh, Patient is hypertensive, but this can be brought under control with medications. Uh, cholesterol level is uh, 238, a bit high, and LDL is also a bit high. Otherwise, uh, lab findings are all normal. ECG, chest film, and echo were all normal. Treadmill was positive for ischemia. And uh, uh, 
multi-slice CT scan and also confirmed by angio showed double vessel uh, disease involving uh, the LED tandem stenosis in the proximal and mid segment and the right coronal artery diffuse narrowing in the mid segment with uh, one focal stenosis uh, uh, also in the same segment. And this is the, these are the medications. Patients were put on uh, ramipril, aspirin, clopidogrel, and dildazem. And in the cat lab table, patient became apprehensive. Uh, uh, the blood pressure uh, increased uh, all of a sudden to two, more than 200. So we had to give a dormicum to calm the patient down. And uh, we did give a, a additional antihypertensive medication at that time. And this is uh, the angio of the right coronary artery. So after fixing the lesions in the left uh, system, the right was attended. You will appreciate here that the patient is a, a bit tachycardia, uh, has a bit of tachycardia, and there is a diffuse narrowing here in the mid segment with focal 90% uh, stenosis here. We use a six friends guider. And we tried to use a cutting balloon here, but the cutting balloon could not be advanced across the focal uh, stenosis. And then uh, the patient uh, developed, uh, sorry. So uh, this is uh, just to show diffuse narrowing in the mid segment and focal stenosis here. Uh, uh, in between mid and distal segment. And this is the cutting balloon, which could not be advanced across the focal stenosis. And then uh, out of the blue, the patient developed sudden severe chest pain, blood pressure declined to 96 systolic, and patient had a rapidly progressive Stanford type A Dunning class three aortic dissection, extending to the cusp and aortic arm. So, uh, we tried to fix the entry point. We thought that the entry point is uh, here. So we, uh, we put two drug eluting stand. Intentionally at that time, we didn't use a covered stand as the initial attempt because the vessel is rather smallest. And we, th we, we think that the re stenosis rate with the covered stand would be very high. And also uh, there is also, we, we only have graph master at that time. We, we also know that uh, with graft master, sometimes we have a foreshortening during uh, uh, the stand implantation. So we have to be very careful with this. So we use a, a drug eluting stand, but at that time we, we noticed also that uh, the right coronary artery has occlusive spiral dissection here. Note that there is no flow here from this point uh, down, downstream, and there is also extra fixations of the contrast agents. But fortunately, uh, contrast injection did not disclose any aortic recurge. So if I may uh, ask uh, your opinion, what is the cause of the perforation and what is the site? I have uh, just one or two uh, uh, answer here. So any, anybody can uh, give his answer about the, the panelists, the moderators, what? So first of all, the, the extension, you didn't show the, the, um, the aorta, but we have the feeling that uh, based on the, on the, on the contrast uh, that we see, we have the feeling that this takes the entire uh, ascending aorta uh, portion, so circular uh, contrast uh, in, in the aortic. Can you tell us how far did, uh, at least based on contrast, uh, the uh, dissection go uh, more uh, towards the aortic arch? I will show you the film later on after okay. this. If I may get the, the uh, short answer about this, what is the cause of perforation? Where is the site? You know that uh, whether this is a uh, question is whether this is in the aorta, or proximal, or mid right, or guide wire induced perforation. Okay, let me proceed. We could not, uh, I could not demonstrate where, where uh, on NGO is the site of perforation. But uh, my postulation. Sorry, is just... sorry. The, the, the concept of perforation comes from where? Yes. Because why are you thinking? As, I'm not sure I saw it on, on angiogram. So why? Are... You see here, there is a contrast exaffization. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Okay. 
So, but we are not seeing it, anything coming from the coronary so far. And the distal, uh, the, the right coronary artery is now occluded. I don't see it coming from the proximal mid portion. So at least proven otherwise, this could be a, a pericardial effusion associated to the uh, a, a dissection of the ascending aorta. Okay, let me proceed. Uh, of course, uh, we need to have a very good blood pressure and heart rate control at the time. And the next question is, uh, uh, I want to fix the uh, coronary ostium uh, at the time. Uh, of course, uh, it is. it would be ideal if I use uh, IFUS, but uh, in this particular case, uh, unfortunately, I didn't have, I didn't use uh, IFUS, but... Uh, so, so maybe a pro provocative question, why do we want to fix the ostium if the, there is no flow in the right coronary artery and you may have the feeling the patient needs surgery, em emergent surgery anyway, or you are not thinking this patient because, needs because emergent surgery? Because I have to act fast. And I thought that the, the, the cause of the perforation is uh, in the coronary ostium because of the, uh, uh, the section perforating the aorta, even though this is a small, in, uh, but uh, I think uh, this is the, the, the origin of the perforation. And then uh, I think that uh, I need to fix that uh, as soon as possible with Sen. As, as I mentioned before, I, fix, uh, I tried to use uh, Sten and not covered Sten for some reasons that I've explained before. So uh, of course, uh, after this, I, I did the aggressive post, I, post deal. I didn't have an osteal flash balloon like that. Uh, so uh, I just uh, use uh, aggressive uh, post deal. But uh, then the next question is, should I neutralize the anticoagulation effect with, with protamine? Uh, may I have an uh, um, extra panelist's uh, opinion? Is it wise or unwise to, to use protamine? Uh, avoid it if I can. Avoid. Coughing can be harder to manage. Okay, I completely agree with you, Sydney. So uh, I decided not to use, uh, not to realize uh, uh, the anticoagulation effect because uh, I think that uh, I still need to fix the uh, right coronary artery occlusion. So I probably uh, would uh, think about this uh, after my gear is out, my gear is out of uh, the coronaries. Of course, uh, I need to stop injecting. Otherwise I may just uh, more, uh, uh, more dissection. But I still have to uh, do injection because I, I still need to uh, fix the right uh, coronary artery of the section. And the next question is, uh, I have to use uh, to do a pericardiosynthesis, a core or pleural guided? Please go ahead or you want or you're asking questions? Yeah, I'm asking questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for Prokhaus and this is, I think, like both, but this a thorough guide would be good. So I, I, I don't want to have a the second experience, so uh, I want to have your expert opinion what to do next time in case uh, we have uh, this kind of uh, problem. So my comment is just, uh, uh, again, it is, it's a basic strategy. If you, if you plan to go for emergent surgery, then you don't need to fix this right coronary artery. Yeah, and yeah. I, I see the distal flow of the RSA was impaired. In this sort of case, usually I will use IFAS to localize the distal uh, landing site for the stand and then just stand uh, with a long stand from the distal RSA to the osseal RSA, see if I can stop the progression of the dissection or resume the flow in the RSA first uh, because uh, uh, this RCA could be very big, and then the patient may result in short uh, if it calls. Okay, let me proceed. So uh, the next question is, uh, do I have to call our my surgical colleague? I thought you already called it. Yes. Called it. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. The, 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 this patient is... Uh, uh, <laughs> classified as dining class three, and also on top of that, with complications. So actually this is a surgical candidate. We have to do CT scan. Uh, uh. I, 
CT scan is just, uh, 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 again, a matter of, uh, of also your, your uh, pre surgeon's preference. I mean, if you see clearly that uh, you have contrast going up to the uh, aortic arch and you are committed to go for surgery and the, the, uh, the, uh, your, your surgeons agrees, then one option would go to the OR and having TOE in the OR. But sometimes I know, that, at least in our institution, um, uh, surgeons are eager to have a CT scan before going for, for it. But it depends also on the hemodynamic status of the patient. Thank you. So, uh, so at that time, uh, I follow uh, Sydney's uh, advice. Uh, uh, I didn't do uh, any attempt uh, to reverse the anticoagulation effect on heparin. So I was uh, a, a bit lucky. I was able to cross the, uh, to fix the, uh, the, the section here. And after a pre deal, uh, I implanted one DES here and then uh, subsequently uh, another DES here, two overlapping DES uh, to allow full lesion coverage here because uh, as you may, uh, remember, this is a, a very long segmental uh, narrowing with focal stenosis here. And so we have, uh, now we have uh, four stents, two overlapping stents here and two overlapping stents uh, uh, in, the, in the ostium. And this is uh, what we see uh, minutes later. You see uh, more perforation, more pericardial effusion, extensive dissection. This is definitely a Turning class three, oh. oh. non flow limiting dissection, the proximal right co uh, corner artery. There is still a, a remaining dissection here, but uh, this is non flow limiting. Yeah. But the section extends uh, upward, upstream to the ascending aorta and arch. You see yeah. the amount of pericardial evolution. So, what to do? Uh, I, I don't know what can I do. Uh, usually, this surgeon's duty, but what I don't I can't do is I don't do the pericardial antithesis in this sort of situation, because maybe there's communication between aorta and the pericardial space. The blood will come out if you do pericardial antithesis. Unless in the last job effect, uh, if you don't do the patient's BP job and uh, with severe tamponade, you want to release something. <laughs> any any other comment? One more comment. So the question is also: Are you also concerned of the of the left coronary systems, or just an impression that it may be also compromised? Okay, that, that's a very good question. So uh, uh, I try to look for uh, other potential complications, as you mentioned, uh, involvement of one or both coronary arteries. Of course, in this uh, particular situation, the left coronary system, which may induce uh, acute myocardial ischemia and or infarction. Contain rupture uh, into the uh, mediastinum or pericardium, which may just pericardial tamponade. Patient is not yet in tamponade. Uh, extension of dissection, which may compromise brain perfusion. Aortic valve uh, disruption, which may induce a, a acute AR and induce uh, acute uh, left heart failure or aortic rupture, uh, which may uh, exsanguinate uh, the patients and uh, let that leads to death. So uh, uh, regarding all these uh, uh, questions, uh, of course, for, for the first question, we need to do uh, 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 contralateral uh, angio. I'm oh, sorry. Contralateral angio, but I don't want to lose access to, uh, of the right corner artery. So I maintain the GR catheter in the right corner artery. Uh, regarding the second question, we know that the patient already has a hemopericardium but not yet uh, tamponade, but uh, there is so far no neurological deficits and so far no uh, acute AR or uh, aortic rupture. Very lucky. So uh, using transradial approach, I, I annulate the right corner artery, but unfortunately the right corner artery was still intact. At the left corner artery uh, was still intact, not involved in the in the dissection process. So uh, this is the right again. Still okay. Uh, the section here in between the two stands, proximal and mid segment. And at this 
point of time, what should I do? Mm. I think you should first localize where is the building site? Is it building direct communicate from the aorta to the midasem, or is it because uh, the guiding catheter sometimes may damage the cups? I had one case uh, similar to this with guiding catheter damage to the non cups, and then continuously, uh, persistently with some butt go to the pericardial space. Um, so first, I think I will localize where is the beating. Okay. Is it from outside? Hemodynamically stable. Pericardial synthesis, uh, we think, we thought that pericardial uh, synthesis is difficult to perform because still non-significant amount of fluid, even uh, if guided by fluoro or echo. And there is still, fortunately, no neurological deficit and no AR. So this is the situation. Yeah. Is it is now the best timing to refer the case for surgery? I... Personally, I, I would have uh, seen uh, a little bit more of this aorta, but it seems quite large to me, uh, based on the on the contrast. So I, I fear that there is me maybe a, a really a dissection which uh, a large lumen involving the ascending aorta. And if the Which, patient did you see CT? Hmm. Yeah, CT, CT, CT can help to localize the beta. Yeah, because he's stable enough at the moment. <laughs> I don't know there's an indication. <laughs> so maybe CT I, I, may help. The, the question is, if you if you see that the, 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 with contrast, maybe you don't see, but if you see with contrast that the, the entire aortic arch is, is, uh, mm. is taken, then at this point in time, the patient qualify for surgery. And again, you have two options. If adequately stable, uh, CT and then OR, or uh, OR and then uh, TOE. So uh, surgery is generally advised without delay, of course. Uh, completely mm -hmm. agree with you. And uh, the aim of surgery is uh, to prevent or treat complications like rupture, pericardial occlusion, a coronary cerebral flow obstruction, and so on. And uh, usually uh, the surgeon would implant a composite graft in the ears, ascending aorta with or without implantation of the coronal arteries. And, but the mortality rate is high, even in centers of excellence. And mortality would be much higher in this case because the patient is heavily anticoagulated. So uh, we discussed this with our uh, house uh, cardiac surgeon and I don't know whether fortunately or unfortunately, he declined. He declined to operate this patient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, after an observation period of 30 minutes. There is no, amount, uh, no increase in the amount of uh, fusions. And there is, uh, after 60 minutes, no increase in the amount of uh, fusions, no hemodynamic uh, compromise, patient of stable, Chest pain, chest pain subsided. So uh, uh, we have a consensus with the cardiac surgeon. If the uh, situation worsens, then he, he would uh, act. Of course, we thought that if he act, act uh, it would be too late. But uh, anyway, that's, that's his advice. So uh, this is, uh, sorry, this is the uh, flow chart. Uh, usually, uh, if a uh, Sorry, just we, we have uh, one process. minute. We need to think. We Sorry, need to one minute to finish so the discussion. So please uh, tell us in one minute uh, how you handle this fantastic case. And then this is uh, 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 the CT scan uh, at th uh, day three. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't work. Okay, you see there is a little bit of irregularities here, which may represent uh, post dissecting uh, thrombus, but there is no more uh, dissection here, and also shown here. 
No so, so you did the, the first no CT scan at day three, so or you did it acutely? Aorta, uh, diameter. So even the aorta diameter is not enlarged. And there is also uh, only minimal fluid collection in the medicine, in mediastinum and the pericardial space. You see here. So is this the, your first CT scan at, at three days? This is at three days. Is the and first. Then, uh, and then, uh, of course, we made the, another CT scan later on, but uh, just uh, because uh, of time limitation, I just want to show you the angiogram at three years. You see here, uh, still patent stands, but the section in the uh, in between the two stands, uh, the, the stands in the proximal and the uh, mid segment. So to sum up, the case of uh, catheter in just uh, type A dissection, running, uh, running class three, complicated with occlusive spiral dissection, pericardial effusion, and perforation were presented. Other risk factors include, included uh, severe hypertension, need for repeated injection, immediate stenting of the entry point at the uh, RCA ostium seemed to control all potentially lethal uh, complications. Surgical compl uh, correction was planned, but not performed in view of the clinical and multi slice CT scan uh, findings that follow up. So the take home me message are as follows. Uh, this condition is usually highly, highly little and should always be considered a surgical emergency. Uh, but uh, we need to always try to uh, immediately fix all potential complications with PCI as much as possible. And immediate stenting of the entry point may control all potentially uh, little uh, complications. We know that some, some patients and some, some people are born lucky like the patient and myself and meticulous attention of blood pressure control and avoidance of repeated injection during PCI is important in this kind of situation. I thank you so much for your attention. So uh, a fantastic case, uh, uh, Professor Santoso. Unfortunately, we are already running late, but this was really an amazing case. It is my pleasure now to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Jen Quang Li from Taiwan. He uh, did his master's degree at the University and National Taiwan University and also got a PhD in, uh, at the Institute of Biomedical Electronics and Bioinformatics and currently is a system professor at the National Taiwan University in Taiwan. He has uh, several interests uh, and uh, there's some specific interest uh, are peripheral artery intervention as well as interven venous intervention. Dr. Lee, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, everyone. Hi, everyone. I would like to share my slide here. Okay, so, okay, so yes. So can you see the slide? Yes, we can see the slides and hear you. Fine. Okay. So, hi everyone. So, uh, so the, 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 sorry, the connection. Sorry, yes. the connection of the audio is suboptimal. Okay. How about now? Better. Okay. So let me start. So. My topic today will be the whole arm when filters are a must, but deployment a must not. So, so this is the case. This is a 58 year old woman. He had the lung cancer, the non-small cell lung cancer with brain metastasis like this. And uh, he had progressively exertional dyspnea and short breath for one month. So he got the bilateral upper lung swelling and exertional facial pressure. So this is the photo for her. So the, the lady says that you can, you, doctor, you can see my face is swelling. In, in my opinion is that, uh, but I don't think you are very, uh, got the face swelling, but he insists, she insists that. And also you can see the bilateral arm is a little swelling. So this is the CT. You can see it's a, a SVC tumor encasement into uh, the superior vera cava here. And this is the area here. So 
after the compression of the superior vena cava, so the patient got symptoms progressively. So this is the diagnostic angiography. As you can see here is the tumor encasement. So the bilateral, whether the right side or the left side cannot uh, drain to the superior vena cava into the right action very smoothly. So we do first, with the kissing stand, and then we do also the post dilatation. So this is the kissing stand. Uh, because currently there's no uh, no stand approval for uh, to deploy in this area. So I deploy the venous stand with the BD Venovo stand. And after the stand deployment, as you can see, there's a residual stenosis here. So I also do a kissing balloon technique here. So this is the angel after the post dilatation like this. So this is the right side angel and this is the left side. And also we uh, do an angiography from uh, the lower part of the superior vena cava. As you can see, there's a slow flow with the uh, no flow phenomenon. So thrombus you may see here and also here and also here. So this is the scenario after the kissing balloon. Initial after the kissing stand, there is a slow drain into the superior vena cava, but then there is no flow uh, drain into the SVG after the uh, kissing balloon technique. So and the, in this time, the patient got uh, sudden dyspnea and agitation. The SP uh, O2 got decreased down to 85%. And we to give the O2 mask to give he the oxygen therapy. So maybe there's some thrombus uh, drain into the right atrium and into the pulmonary artery. So this is the initial scenario that we think is the tumor compression for the SVC here. So our idea initially is very simple that we can put the stand, the kissing stand here to overcome radial force from the outside of the tumor. But we should know that not only the tumor compression here, but also after the flow is diminished, then uh, there's thrombus here, as you can see in our case. So after the stand deployment, we put a stand, but after the balloon dilatation, the thrombus initially outside the stand, then going into inside the stand. So the patient got symptoms and there's no reflow then. So what to do next? So this is our uh, scenario. Initial, there's a thrombus and also the tumor compression here. So after the stand deployment, after the kissing balloon, then the thrombus initially outside the stand, then into inside the stand here. So, what is Dr. The Dr. Lee, I have a question because uh, the vessel was occluded before and is occluded now. But yes. In between, but in between, the patient is getting worse. So, obviously, there is something else going on. Yes. Are you now yes. worried? Are you now worried to fix? Uh, this thrombus component in the stent, or yes. should you be worried about what is going on elsewhere? Yes, so there's two questions here. The, uh, initially, the vessel is occluded. Even now, after the procedure, the, the, the vessel is still occluded, but the patient got symptoms. So uh, the first thing we want to do is that maybe how to overcome the thrombus, maybe into the pulmonary artery, into the pulmonary embolism. So the anticoagulation is very important. The first thing. The second thing is to give the oxygenation therapy. And the next thing is that even the patient now is occluded, you should be aware that, that uh, how to overcome. Now the thrombus is going into the stent, whether the symptoms going further into the pulmonary artery and into the uh, pulmonary embolism is very important. So, so the problems now, the stent thrombosis with acute closure complicated with pulmonary embolism. 
Now this is the problem. So what to do next? Initially, we want to do, as you know, the, the polyembryos and the goal therapy is to give the systemic thrombolytic therapy. And now with the progress, we can now do the casita directed thrombolysis. But don't forget that the patient got is high breathing risk because the patient had brain metastasis. Although there's no ICH, the history, but still we should consider that. So parental anticoagulation, we give it the first without the thrombolysis, the thrombolytic agent. And uh, the other thing is that although initial is occluded and then now it's occluded, still we want to do more to open this closure. So we bail out the stand to establish the SVC flow. And then the other thing is that we try, we want to do this bailout procedure to give uh, to uh, outside the thrombus. So this is the rescue stand deployment. So after the two stand deployment here, you can see this flow into the right action uh, slowly, but still you can see here is a thrombus here. So we got uh, a lot of to afraid that the fear for the uh, further uh, pulmonary embolism. So we give the anticoagulation and the into the ICU for monitor. So this is the rescue stand deployment like this. So this is an initial Venovo stand. And the second two stand is the Illuminex like this. And this is the final angiography. Although there's a swamp bus, but we have the flow now. After the procedure, the patient, the dyspnea and the symptom got better. So we go to the ICO for the systemic anticoagulation for one day. So the parenteral anticoagulation and the close monitor. After three days, the symptoms improve, but the swelling, the facial swelling and the bilateral arm swelling is not improved. So after three days, we do a second angiography. So you can see there's a thrombus with a stand total occluded for the two, uh, these uh, stands here. So now we are back to the initial scenario that's the SAVC is total occluded, but now we have stand deployed in the SVC. So what to do next? So things in mind is that this is a huge thrombus. So stand is not feasible only. We need to do the thrombolysis. But for the history with brain metastasis, maybe the castellatory thrombolysis is a good choice for this patient. But uh, don't forget that this is a huge thrombus. After the thrombolysis, there's high risk for the pulmonary embolism. So you may want to do to give the SVC filter in this case. But uh, what is the landing zone? Where is the landing zone for the SVC filter? Don't forget that. Now, the, the further to stand, the Illuminix is deployed here. And it's only the landing zone is only here and then it's the right entry. So it's very difficult for this patient. So we want to do the catheter thrombolysis, but we don't have the enough zone, uh, enough zone for the, the landing for the SVC filter. So this is the first here. Maybe we can put the SVC filter here, but now you know that after the putting the filter, you may in angle, to the stand and then you will not be able to retrieve this filter. So what to do next? Maybe, maybe we can put the filter here, but if we put the filter here, then the SVC filter is into the right action. So you may encounter one scenario is like this. Maybe it's a dislodgement after deployment. The SVC filter will be like this into the pulmonary artery. So what to do next? So if we put the SVC filter, it may go into the pulmonary artery. So what to do next? So we try to open the SVC filter here. So you can see we open 
the SVC filter. But after open the SVC filter, we do not deploy the SVC filter. So this is the, the SVC filter. We do not deploy. So still, it is uh, connected to the hook. We do, do not deploy. But then we put the bilateral echoes consider for the consider the ready thrombosis. So after 24 hours is one day, the symptom improved like this. So you can see the thrombus resolve very beautifully. And still the SVC filter without deployment still here. So then it's inside you SVC filter successfully, then we retrieve very quickly because we do not deploy the SVC filter. Still the hook is linked to the deployment. So this is the filter after retrieve. You can see there's a lot of thrombus into inside the filter. So this is the final angiography. So we got improved SVC flow and we put the filter smoothly and successfully retrieved it. So the patient got sustained clinical improvement. As you can see, this is a swelling phase and on, and then now it's better. Then. So this is a take home message. So strong light do exist in SVC syndrome. Although we always see that maybe it's only the external compression. Don't forget the poor flow going into the thrombus formation. So balloon angioplasty after a state deployment, you should be do it very cautiously. And then the waste filter are mandatory for the carcinogenic thrombosis in SVC thrombosis because this area. A lot of thrombus after the thrombolysis, the thrombus going into the pulmonary artery very quickly because it's only very nearby. So SVC filter are pliable in this and the feasible and the mandatory in this scenario. The final thing is that now, if the deployment, the landing zone is not good, maybe you can open the filter but without deployment, it's safe to use with when uh, no good landing zone. Thank you. So uh, fantastic case. Uh, so we have now a few minutes uh, for the discussion. Maybe I, I, I will start. There was also a comment from the chat. Any role for, for thrombectomy devices? Personally, I was thinking maybe something for Rotarex uh, A8 French uh, is the first question. And uh, the second one, what is the long-term patency of this construct uh, of uh, four stents uh, in a cancer patient with already uh, external compression? So the, the question is very good. The first thing is that even we can use the thrombectomy device, still it's very important that we cannot avoid the thrombus into the pulmonary artery. And uh, don't forget, if we use the A-French, the, uh, the, the Rotaris, the Asperex, is still risky for the, the, the emboli into the pulmonary artery. So the, the filter is still very important, I think. Another thing is that also the, uh, the, the, the Asperex or the Rotaris is not indicated in this area. So you should do it very, very, carefully. The second thing is what is the long-term patency for the SVC syndrome? Uh, in my practice, currently I have done the SVC uh, intervention, maybe for 200 cases. Most of the patients are symptom-free if we can uh, put a stand very smoothly and with the medication, with anticoagulation, then the, the event is very small. Most of the the stand, the event comes from the tumor uh, progression, not from the stand, the thrombosis. This is my uh, personal experience. So fantastic uh, personal experience, really. I think a few people in the world have the same degree of experience. So this is open for discussion. Please, anybody with some questions or? So in this particular patient, what is the follow-up? 
how is she doing at, at what uh, follow-up time yes so uh my my hospital is a tertiary hospital that have a lot of patients with the lung cancer or something metastatic cancer so most of the, these patients is for the symptom not for the cure 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 so we, we, we discuss this with, with the oncologist. So after the stand deployment, we always give the medication with anticoagulation. In the past, we have only Coumadin, but nowadays we, we can use the NOAC to, 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 to prescribe in these patients. So most of the patients are very good. So do we need to follow up with the angiography or the CT? Uh, in these patients, they always been, have been followed up in the oncology. They always do a lot of CT. So don't, we, we don't need to do the angiography. And then the second thing is that the SVC syndrome, the SVC stenting or endovascular procedure for this patient is a bailout procedure and it's a bridging procedure. The most of thing is the symptom, not from the stand patency. Can I ask, can I ask, is it routine now to prevent the PE in the terms of doing the stenting? So are you preferentially doing it all the time, putting a, a filter there now because it's so common? Yes. So uh, I don't think it's always to put the SVC filter as a routine practice, no. But uh, if you put stand, then after putting the stand, you now in, in my practice, after putting the stand, not always for the post dilatation, I will do the angel wafting after the stand performance and the, to see the thrombus burden. If the thrombus burden is very, very large, then you don't need to give a one to one balloon kissing balloon technique, then the thrombus will go into a lot. Maybe you can use uh, maybe a 60% large balloon angioplasty and then to give any coagulation. The second thing is that even for every SVC stem procedure, I will give the pre-medication with the anticoagulation, maybe for the cleansing, maybe for two or three days, then I do the procedure. So we have a question from the chat. So maybe uh, um, a participant is asking whether would have been retrospectively better to go for back to me uh, and before the second layer of stents. Oh, <laughs> uh, stents. Uh, in, in my uh, personal uh, from the study and also doing the retrospective to research. In nowadays, the SVC stenting is in, in little research that SVC stenting now is very is feasible for doing the tumor compression or but the what what stands or what kinds of stand there's no stand standing uh standard procedure. Some some patient will use the cover stand. The some patient now use the new generation, the venous stand. Now in, in our hospital, we use the uh, venous stand with the uh, Venovo stand. Mm. Very good. So I think uh, if there are no uh, other questions in the interest of time, I would give, give back the word uh, to uh, the organizer. And again, uh, thanking uh, Dr. Lee for his uh, great presentation. Thank you. Okay. okay, thank you. So I would like to... Um, so on, on behalf of the Hong Kong College of Cardiology, I would like to thank once again um, our co uh, my co-moderator, Rosanna, DW, and Marco for keeping the time very well and uh, moderating very good discussions. I, I would like to also thank the panelists for uh, sharing uh, with us uh, their good comments and learning points. I'm sure all of you agree this is a, a, a conference with many learning points. Uh, we are going to organize our next uh, Hong Kong complex cardiovascular intervention around uh, half a year later, and hope to see you all by that time. So before we say goodbye, shall I ask all of you to uh, turn on the video and we take a group photo? <laughs> Luki, please take a photo for us. Yeah, sure. With a, with a smile, with a smile. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, uh, one, two, three, cheers.
Thank you. And one more one, two, three, cheese. Thank you. Nice weekend. Okay. Thank you. Okay, many thanks and goodbye. Thank you. See bye you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you so much.